There's one. Let's just go. Um, Faith or George, just yeah. walk over on the other side. Take that red chair and okay. move over here. Okay, so you want me to sit over here? That black chair? Or do you want me to sit next to the jurors? I want you to sit next to the jurors over okay, here. Over here, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to get the red chair. No. Yeah. Well, you could watch. Okay, uh, just a minute, George. Don't leave. All right, we're on the record. The jurors are here. All jurors are here. Okay. And um, Court TV asked me to put on the record uh, what they cannot um, show. And it's the first video? Correct. Okay. It, who's, where's Court TV? Anybody, a representative that I can focus on? All right, so do you have any questions? Hmm? Do you have any questions? Okay. Here comes Grace. Oh. Hannah, right? This is Grace from Grace. Oh, Grace. Okay, Grace, remember Remember we talked? Yes. Okay, so this is one of those videos that we don't want to show. So it's going to be her first uh, witness, and it'll be the first exhibit. First exhibit, first witness. That's why we have multiple cameras, so we'll show anything but that video. And not the jurors. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so we're going to call in the jurors. All right, you may be seated.
All right, the matter I'm calling is State of New Mexico versus Hannah Gutierrez, D101CR, 2023-40. Parties state their name. Good morning, Your Honor. Jason Willis and Karen Morrissey on behalf of State of New Mexico. Good morning, Your Honor. Jason Bowles, Carmela Cisneros, and Todd Bullion are here for Hannah Gutierrez. Ruiz, who is present. All right, thank you very much. All right, jurors, so I, um, first of all, thank you for your patience. Um, as they say, accidents happen, so thank you. All right, so I'm going to uh, give you an explanation of trial procedure. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. And um, I already swore you in yesterday, okay? So, where'd George go? Just gonna tell you you've met my bailiff. There he is, okay. Um, yeah, we need, do we need him? Um, yeah, we'll wait. Hello. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I call the case. So this is a criminal case commenced by the state charging uh, the uh, defendant with a third amended criminal information. I will uh, read this to you to remind you of what the charges are. Uh, it sounds formal. Count one, involuntary manslaughter. In that honor about October 21, 2021, in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87508. The above named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins, committed in the commission of an unlawful act, to wit, negligent use of a deadly weapon. In the alternative, count one, involuntary manslaughter, in that honor about October 21, 2021, in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87508. The above named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins, committed in the commission of a lawful act, which might produce death in an unlawful manner or without due caution or circumspection. Count two, tampering with evidence, in that honor about October 21, 2021, in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, the above named defendant did transfer narcotics to another person with the intent to prevent the apprehension, prosecution, or conviction of herself. And the, thank you. All right. So remember that uh, Ms. Hannah Gutierrez is presumed innocent. The burden is on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, I have some instructions to give you. These are, are uh, instructions that you'll follow throughout the trial. First of all, the most one of the most important is all of you must pay close attention to the evidence. After you've read all of the evidence, I will read the final instructions of law to you. You will also receive a written copy of all instructions. You must follow the final instructions in deciding the case. Again, the trial is expected to last um, uh, possibly through May 8th, and um, it, we're here every day except the weekends, 8, 830 to 5, okay? Um, we'll take a morning break, we'll take a lunch break, we'll take an afternoon break. Um, let's see. Please report to uh, where you've reported today uh, at 830 so we can start. If you know you might be late for some reason, please leave early. Um, do not come into the courtroom unless you are accompanied by George, my bailiff. You may take water into the courtroom with you, but um, no hot liquid or coffee. We stand up out of respect for you because you are the ultimate decision makers as to the facts in this particular case. So when you come into court, go ahead, be seated, and after all of you are seated, we will be seated. It is so important to hear. Do not miss one word. Raise your hand, don't wait, don't be shy, okay? Uh, this is a public proceeding, so people may go in and out. You may find yourself looking at who is going in and out. 
but after a while I think you'll get used to it. However, if there is anything distracting you from being able to listen and be involved in the case, please tell George and he'll let me know. Really can't uh, do anything about the temperature, so um, as I said, uh, layers. You are allowed but not required to take notes during trial. George will hand you each a notepad and a pen or pencil. Please put your name on the front of the page, on the front of the uh, pad, and then take notes beginning on the second page. On breaks, leave them on your chair or have follow what George says, leave or take back to the jury room. Uh, he'll collect the, them uh, at the end of the day and in the morning he'll return them. Please don't worry about your notes being read by anyone. They're locked up at night and then at the end of the trial they're shredded immediately, okay? Don't let your notes take the place of your independent memory of the evidence. When taking notes, please don't forget to pay close attention to the witnesses during their testimony because it will help you assess their appearance, behavior, memory, and whatever else bears on their credibility. Let's go through the order of trial for um, any of you that have not been through a criminal trial. A criminal trial generally begins with the lawyers telling you what they expect the evidence to show. This is called opening statements. These statements made by the lawyers during the course of trial can be of considerable assistance to you in understanding the evidence as it is presented at trial. Statements of the lawyers, however, are not themselves evidence. The evidence will be the testimony of the witnesses, exhibits, and any facts agreed to by the parties. After you have heard all of the evidence, I will then give you final instructions on the law. The lawyers will argue the case, that's called closing argument, and then you will retire to the jury room to arrive at a verdict. It is my duty to decide what evidence you may consider. Your job is to find and determine the facts in this case, which you must do solely upon the evidence received here in court. It is the duty of the lawyer to object to questions, testimony, or exhibits the lawyer believes may not be proper, and you must not hold such objection against the objecting party. I will sustain objections if the question or evidence sought is improper for you to consider. If I sustain an objection to evidence, you must not consider such evidence, nor may you consider any evidence that I have told you to disregard. By itself, a question is not evidence. You must not speculate about what would be the answer to a question that I rule cannot be answered. It is for you to decide whether the witnesses know what they are talking about and whether they are being truthful. You may give the testimony of any witness whatever weight you believe it merits. You may take into account, among other things, the witness's ability and opportunities to observe, memory, manner, or any bias or prejudice that the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the testimony considered in light of all of the evidence in the case. No ruling, gesture, or comment I make during the course of the trial should influence your decision in this case. At times I may ask questions of witnesses. If I do, such questions do not in any way indicate my opinion about the facts or indicate the weight I feel you should give to the testimony of the witness. Questions by jurors. Ordinarily, the attorneys will develop all pertinent evidence. It is the exception rather than the rule that an individual juror will have an unanswered question after all of the evidence is presented. However, if you feel an important question has not been asked or answered, write it down on a piece of your note paper and give it to George before the witness leaves the stand. I will decide whether or when your question will be asked. Rules of evidence or other considerations apply to questions you submit and may prevent the question from being asked. If the question is not asked, please do not give it any further consideration, do not discuss it with the other jurors, and please do not hold it against either side that you did not get an answer. Conduct of jurors. You must again decide the case solely upon the evidence received in court. You must not consider anything you may have read or heard about the case outside the courtroom. During the trial and your deliberations, you must avoid news accounts of the trial, whether they be on radio, television, the internet, or in a newspaper or other written publication. You must not visit the scene of the incident on your own. You cannot make experiments with reference to this case. You cannot Google anything about this case, do any research about the subject matter of the case. 
and that would include anything regarding this uh, pre or current. If an exhibit is, until you retire, this is very important, until you retire to deliberate the case, and that means after closing argument when you've received all the evidence, you must not discuss this case or the evidence with anyone, even with each other. So as I said yesterday, I'm sorry to harp, but this is so important. What I said yesterday was you cannot, while you're in that jury deliberation room, that is not a time for you to discuss uh, the case while you're sitting around. No, it's, as I said, after all of the evidence, that'll be down the line, March 8th, that's, in, and we send you off to deliberate. That's when you can discuss the case, when you're in deliberations, okay? Um, let's see. If an exhibit is admitted in evidence, you should examine it yourself and not talk about it with other jurors until you retire to deliberate. It is important that you keep an open mind and not decide any part of the case until the entire case has been completed and submitted to you. Your special responsibility as jurors demands that throughout this trial, you exercise your judgment impartially and without regard to any sympathy, bias, or prejudice. To minimize the risk of accidentally overhearing something that is not evidence in this case, please continue to wear the jurors' badges while in and around the courthouse. If someone happens to discuss the case in your presence, report that fact to George immediately. Although it is natural to visit with people you meet, please do not talk with any of the attorneys, parties, witnesses, or spectators either in, a, in or out of the courtroom. If you meet in the hallways or elevators or elsewhere, there is nothing wrong with saying a good morning or a good, good afternoon, but your conversation should end there. If the attorneys, parties, and witnesses do not greet you outside of the courtroom or avoid riding in the same elevator with you, they are not being rude. They are just carefully observing this rule, and they definitely wanted me to tell you that so that um, you, 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 know, you don't think they're being rude, okay? All right, so we'll do the exclusion rule. Yes, Your Honor. All right, and we will begin the, the evidence. Your Thank Honor, you. No, Not the evidence. Any approach just yes. about the rule of exclusion? and have poker faces, but I said May 8th, I meant March 8th, okay. <laughs> a little, little panic there, but uh, nobody, nobody showed their panic. All right, so May, uh, March 8th, okay. Now, I'm going to remind, you will hear this, it will sound, there's going to be two things that sound like a broken record, and one is, Every time we take a break or whatever, do not talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Very important. The other thing is, because um, we are doing court TV, I don't know if you all know that, um, but, and by the way, they're not filming you. They're not allowed to film you, so um, 
Don't worry about that. And then because you're wearing your juror, juror badges, they will know to leave you alone in and around the courthouse and lunch and everything, whatever, okay? Now, um, I will be saying a lot uh, that the witnesses may not be watching the live stream court TV. That's important to uh, so that they're not hearing the evidence. That's what they just asked me to do. So that will come whenever I think of it because as they pointed out, a witness may get on the, the uh, live stream and have missed my um, direction, although they should know it anyway. Okay? All right, so I, I did say we'll start the evidence, but that, that's actually wrong. It's, we're going to start with opening statement, which is not evidence. Okay? Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Your Honor, counselors. Uh, my name is Jason Lewis, and I know that we were introduced briefly yesterday during the jury selection process. I wanted to introduce myself again. Uh, my co-counsel is Carrie Morrissey, who most of you spoke to, uh, at least in some, uh, to, to some degree yesterday. Also at council table is Shad Bo. He is our IT specialist, and Corporal Alexander Hancock. Uh, she is what's called our case agent, and she is a witness who you will be hearing from uh, later, maybe, maybe later today, if not certainly by tomorrow. Um, as the judge mentioned earlier, it is Ms. Morrissey's and mine responsibility to prove to your all satisfaction that Ms. Gutierrez committed the two crimes with which she's been charged uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the two crimes she's been charged with are involuntary manslaughter and tampering with evidence. Um, this morning, I hope to give you a roadmap of what we intend to introduce uh, throughout the trial and although the statements that I'm making this morning aren't evidence and you can't consider what I'm saying for purposes of your deliberations uh, I just I hope to give you a preview of what the evidence is about uh, what witnesses you're going to be hearing from uh, and again kind of highlight some of the key pieces of evidence that we think we're going to be showing you uh, throughout the trial but most importantly uh, what we want to do is give you the information that you need to answer two key, two key questions. Um, the first being, what are the events that happened on the set of rust that led to the death of Helena Hutchins? And the second question is, uh, how did live ammunition end up on the set of the movie? As to both questions, we believe uh, that it was the negligent acts and failures of the defendant, Ms. Gutierrez, that resulted uh, in both the acts that contributed to Ms. Hutchins' death and to the live rounds being uh, brought onto the set. Uh, a bit later on, I'm going to uh, explain to you exactly how we believe that happened. Um, give me just a minute. I'm gonna put some images up on the screen for you guys, but there's a little process we have to go through to get that going. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Helena Hutchins. Um, this is the victim in the case that we're here to deal with this morning. Uh, Ms. Hutchins was born in Ukraine on April 9th, 1979. She was married, her husband's name is Matthew, and she has one son who was nine years old uh, at the time of her death. As a child, Ms. Hutchins lived uh, on a Russian military base loaded, located in the Arctic um, she took an early and keen interest in film and journalism. Uh, she studied both economics and journalism at the Kiev National University, 
uh, where she received a degree in international journalism. Miss Hutchins met her husband, Matthew, uh, when she was working in the United States in Los, An in Los Angeles, California. Uh, they hit it off so well that they eventually got married. Uh, and when Ms. Hutchins moved and immigrated into the United States, uh, she continued her education and she eventually earned a master's degree in 2015 from the American Film Institute Conservatory. While in Los Angeles, Ms. Hutchins transitioned into the film and television industry working as a cinematographer. Um, this was a job that she loved and she had a great passion for. Um, for those of you, oh, I'm just sorry. Just speak up. Okay, I apologize. My microphone has been off this whole time and I didn't know. Um, for those of you who may not know, a cinematographer uh, is a person who works behind the scenes on a film and uh, the cinematographer is responsible for creating the overall vision of the film. Uh, in very basic terms, the, cin the cinematographer decides how the movie will be lit and colored and how the final footage will appear on the screen when you watch the movie. Uh, and in fact, Ms. Hutchins was working as a cinematographer for the movie Rust, uh, which when she was tragically shot and killed on October 21st, 2021. Um, by all accounts, from the folks who knew her and worked with her, and many of those you will be hearing from. Um, she was a gifted and talented artist, uh, but above all, she was a loving wife and mother. And like Ms. Hutchins, uh, the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, was also a behind the scenes member of the Rust crew. Um, Ms. Gutierrez was hired to perform a dual role on the movie. Um, she was hired to be both an armorer and a props assistant. As a props assistant, uh, it was Ms. Gutierrez's primary duty to essentially go out and source and bring back to the film set everything that the actors need to touch as part of making the movie. So for example, if they're doing a kitchen scene, then Ms. Gutierrez would have gone out, purchased plates, cups, glasses, forks, all of that sort of stuff, and then those would have been incorporated into the set. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Gutierrez's other role was as the movie's armorer, and it's that role that really has brought us here today. The armorer has a few key responsibilities. Um, the first responsibility is to source and bring to the set all of the firearms that are going to be used as part of the movie. <clears throat> so for a modern movie, that may, it re that may have required her to purchase or uh, obtain machine guns, semi-automatic semi handguns, uh, long rifles, and that sort of thing. But for a Western like Rust, uh, the armorer would have to source weapons that were in use at the time so that the movie looks more authentic. And so that would include finding old looking revolvers uh, and shotguns uh, and, and things of that nature. I've just put up a photo. This is the firearm that Mr. Baldwin was using in this movie. Um, this is also the firearm that was uh, used in the incident that resulted in the death of uh, Ms. Hutchins. One of the things that I think it's important for you all to understand is that throughout this trial, we all may refer to these type of firearms as prop guns, but make no mistake, they are legitimate firearms. If you put a bullet, a live bullet, inside of these guns, they will fire. So we sometimes refer to them as prop weapons, um, but they are absolutely capable of causing a projectile to fly out of the barrel. Um, the other thing uh, that it's important for you all to know is that although the, this particular weapon looks old, uh, it is actually a brand new gun. Uh, this gun was purchased directly from the manufacturer for, this, for the purpose of being used in this movie. And although it looks old, 
Uh, it has, it's not a gun that has had hundreds or thousands of rounds put through it. It was a brand new and perfectly functioning gun when it arrived on the set. Uh, the second thing that the armorer is responsible for is sourcing and purchasing blank and dummy ammunition. You're gonna be hearing a lot throughout this trial about the differences between live ammunition, blank ammunition, dummy ammunition. So I'm just gonna kinda give you a 10,000 foot overview of, of what this stuff is. The image that's on your screen right now is what's called a blank round. A blank round is actually pretty easy to distinguish because it has that crimped end where, a, where normally a bullet would be. Uh, the reason that blanks are used in the movie is because when it's in the gun and an actor pulls a trigger, uh, there is enough gunpowder inside of that blank to cause a pop and have a, a cloud of smoke come out from the gun, but it doesn't have a projectile that shoots through the barrel of the gun. So these are a type of uh, round that is used frequently on the movie sets, especially whenever they wanna make, uh, make it look like the actor is actually firing a weapon. The second type of round that is used on the sets are what's called dummy rounds. And these are a little bit, these are a different story. Dummies look exactly like real bullets. As you can tell from kind of that main image there, although this uh, evidence dummy round has some writing on it, you wouldn't be able to distinguish that from a live bullet if you were just looking at it with your eyes. Uh, and because these dummy rounds are designed to look exactly like live ammunition, <clears throat> every round has to be thoroughly checked before it is put inside of one of these firearms. Um, aside from sourcing firearms, blanks, and dummies for the movie, uh, the next major function that Hannah was required to do on the movie set is that she was required to check every single one of these rounds uh, to make sure that it's a, the appropriate blank or dummy and not live ammunition before it gets inserted into the gun. And there are two primary ways uh, that an armorer or anybody who's familiar with this can check to make sure that a, a round is a dummy round. The first thing they can do is shake it. And if you'll see in that, uh, on the lower right hand side, we, I've got a photograph for you there of a plastic container that's got three BBs in it. Um, those BBs are inside of that dummy round so that whenever you shake it, you can audibly hear that it's making a noise and that way you know it's a dummy round. Sometimes they have a little spring in there rather than these bullets, but they always have some sort of noise maker in there. Uh, the other way to distinguish a dummy from a real live bullet is in that top right photograph and you'll see that that, uh, that cartridge has a hole drilled into the side of the casing. That's the second way that you can distinguish a dummy round from a live round. And then we have, not to overcomplicate things, but I think it's important that you know this, we also have some dummy rounds that are missing what's called the primer. Uh, normally on a, on a live cartridge, there's a, an, ex, uh, an explosive element that is inside of that center portion that whenever the hammer of the gun hits that primer, it causes a small spark that then ignites the rest of the gunpowder in the bullet and causes the, uh, the projectile to be expelled. So dummy rounds, as you can, as you can see, uh, they do look an awful lot like live ammunition, but there are ways, if you are careful, that you can distinguish a, uh, a dummy round from a live round. The next major function of the armorer is to check the firearm before it is brought on to the set. Um, and there's a very specific process that is used for this. Uh, when it's time for a firearm to be used, 
The armorer is required to present the firearm to the first assistant director to double check that only dummy rounds uh, are inside the gun. And the armorer is also supposed to offer the actor who is receiving the gun the opportunity to also have the gun inspected in front of them. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in this case, uh, Ms. Gutierrez did not always adhere to these uh, safety procedures. And you're going to hear from several witnesses who will testify that she often rushed through this critical step uh, and skipped, and sometimes she skipped this check altogether. So <clears throat> let's turn to what happened on October 21st, 2021. The cast and crew of the Rust film we're out at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, which is a, uh, a ranch located just outside the city limits of Santa Fe. Um, it's several, several thousand acres large, and it has an Old West style uh, town that's built there, and uh, often movies are filmed there. And I've got an example, an example photo here, just to kind of give you an idea of what the set looks like. Um, it's nothing particularly fancy. It's just an Old West looking town. Uh, part, part of the set, and this is located a little bit away from the town itself, is this church. And it was at this church that the incident resulting in Miss Hutchins' death occurred. Um, the evidence is going to show that on October 21st, it was a fairly chaotic day on the set of the movie. Um, the evening before, a group of camera operators who had some concerns about various safety issues on set sent an email to the production team uh, indicating that they were going to be quitting. And so the next day, in response to this notice, uh, the producers decided to push ahead with filming anyway and they decided to use less camera equipment than what was normally used, and they tried to just improvise and make do with what they had. Filming on the morning of the 21st was largely uneventful. The cast and crew filmed several scenes without any particular incidents occurring. Um, leading up to the lunch hour, a small group of cast and crew were inside uh, the church, working on getting some close-up shots of Alec Baldwin sitting on a church pew uh, and manipulating his uh, revolver. That scene was completed just before lunch, and so they called for a lunch break. Uh, and let me back up just a little bit. Uh, before the lunch break was called, I, I want you all to see what was going on. Uh, this is a... So that gives you an idea of what was going on that morning. Uh, Alec Baldwin was sitting on a church pew and he was practicing this draw from his holster uh, with the camera crew kind of close up on top of him. So they completed that scene and they called for uh, the lunch hour to occur. Um, so during the lunch hour, Ms. Gutierrez took the gun from Mr. Baldwin and she uh, took it back to the, to the safe, the gun safe, that was loaded on a prop cart. Um, once lunch was over, the production decided that they wanted to continue working inside of the church. Um, but at this point, they weren't actually filming anything like they were in this video that I just showed you. And instead, they were doing what's called a blocking. And that is in film terms, what you do before you even get to a rehearsal. So it's like a very rough rehearsal where the lighting director, the camera operator, and all of the folks are trying to get things situated so that they can then move into a rehearsal. Whenever a blocking is going on, because they aren't filming, 
I, there's really no need for the actor to have a live uh, firearm in their hands or even for the live firearm to yet be, be on set. Um, you're going to hear from several witnesses or from one witness in particular uh, who's going to testify that for purposes of blocking, uh, Mr. Baldwin could have been using a stick, a rubber gun, uh, anything that would essentially allow him to mimic a gun. It didn't have to be a live firearm. Um, on that day, though, the defendant was asked to provide Mr. Baldwin with a live firearm for the blocking. Uh, and she did, and, and that was within her discretion to do so. Um, you're going to hear that on the day of the shooting, Ms. Gutierrez loaded the gun in the morning with five rounds. Uh, the revolver, though, is a six-shooter, so it can hold six rounds, but in that morning, she only was able to load five of them. Uh, after the lunch break was over, uh, Ms. Gutierrez retrieved the gun from the safe and she cleaned that sixth hole and was able to put a sixth round into the sixth slot. Ms. Gutierrez then took the firearm to the church and handed the gun over to the first assistant director, whose name is Dave Halls. Ms. Gutierrez and Mr. Halls then did a sloppy and incomplete safety check of the gun where the dummy rounds were not removed from the gun and rattled or checked to see if they had a hole drilled in it. Instead, she just kind of cracked open the gun and partially sp spun the cylinder to show Mr. Halls a few of the rounds. But they were not removed from the gun and they weren't all checked. After the incident happened, and when Ms. Gutierrez was being interviewed by, by the investigating officers, uh, she stated that when she removed the gun from the safe to begin the filming uh, for the afternoon session, she didn't recheck the ammunition. So when she pulled the gun out and put the sixth bullet in, she didn't independently check the rounds at that time either. Our witnesses are going to testify uh, that when the defendant pulled the gun out of the safe after, the, after lunch, what she should have done was open the gun and independently herself checked each and every round. Then when she took it to the church and handed it to Mr. Halls, she should have done a second complete ammo check with Mr. Halls because this double redundancy is what helps prevent the kind of incidents that occurred to Ms. Hutchins from happening. This means she should have opened the gun, removed each cartridge, confirmed that they were dummy rounds by individually shaking them, rattling them, or seeing the board hole. Uh, and because, the, because these dummy rounds are so similar to live rounds, her decision to just crack it open and spin the cylinder a little bit to look at the head stamps wasn't enough. She needed to do a much more complete check. So having failed to do that check herself, she then handed the firearm to Mr. Halls anyway. She exited the church, and then Mr. Halls handed the firearm to Mr. Baldwin. As the blocking session was underway, Mr. Hutchins and, uh, excuse me, Ms. Hutchins and several of her crewmates were busily working, looking through and adjusting cameras, uh, and Mr. Baldwin was sitting on that church pew uh, practicing how he would hold the gun for the upcoming filming session. Um, as Mr. Baldwin was manipulating the firearm, uh, it, he caused it to discharge, and that unfortunately sent a projectile uh, flying directly at Ms. Ms. Hutchins. <coughs> Uh, the projectile shot completely through Ms. Hutchins and then struck the film's director, Joel Souza, in the shoulder. So at this point, the set paramedic was called into the church and began life-saving efforts on both Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza. 
Another crew member who was in the church called 911 to report the shooting and to seek additional medical assistance. But because of the ranch's remote location, it took some time before additional medical per personnel arrived. Um, and, and this additional support also included a, a life flight helicopter for Ms. Hutchins. Um, a team of medical personnel worked to stabilize her uh, and they placed her on the life flight to UNMH. Um, but sadly, the personnel at UNMH were unable to overcome the injuries that she sustained uh, and she was pronounced deceased at UNMH. We will show you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but that by failing to make those vital safety checks, uh, the defendant acted, neg acted negligently and without due caution, and that the decisions she made that day ultimately contributed to Ms. Hutchins' death. So that's what happened on the 21st. But now I want to talk to you a little bit about what happened leading up to the 21st. There are some other ways that Ms. Hutchins, or excuse me, that Ms. Gutierrez was negligent on the set. We intend to call several witnesses to give testimony that she regularly failed to properly carry out her duties as an armorer. Uh, these witnesses are going to describe the defendant's conduct as unprofessional and sloppy. You will hear testimony that she routinely left guns and ammunition lying around the set unattended and that her gun safe and ammo cart were constantly disorganized. The second question that we want to answer for you is where these live bullets came from. The prospect of live ammunition landing up on a film set is incomprehensible. It's something that should never happen. Uh, it's a hard and fast industry rule that live ammunition should be miles away from a film set at all times because of the risk that it poses for being confused with the dummy rounds that are used on the set. I'm showing you a picture now of a box of ammunition uh, that Ms. Gutierrez says she was pulling cartridges from uh, and loading into Mr. Baldwin's fire, uh, firearm on the day the fatal shooting occurred. Um, if you can see the arrow that I'm kind of wiggling around here, this is the box of ammunition that she was pulling from. This is a box of dummies. The second box here is a box of blanks. So these are the kind of rounds that will pop and create smoke. These are the type of rounds that are just supposed to be completely inert. When the officers arrived on the set uh, after the shooting, this cart is where those two box of, boxes of ammunition were first found. Um, when the officer who uh, was in charge of this prop cart uh, uncovered that the boxes on there were, were the ones that were being used for that day's filming, he then placed them into his police unit, and that's what you saw in those previous slides. Uh, these are the boxes of ammunition inside of a cop car. Eventually, uh, these, the, the box of dummies was uh, taken back to the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office where it was inventoried and photographed by a crime scene, a crime scene technician whose name is Marissa Popple, and she's gonna be a witness in this case. Um, the first box of dummies that was opened up is what is on your monitors right now. Uh, this is a styrofoam container that has approximately 37 cartridges in, in it. Uh, according to the label on the outside of the box, uh, these are supposed to be dummy cartridges. And I don't know if you've noticed yet, but there is one of these cartridges that doesn't look like the others. It's that one with the red square. Uh, you can see that it has a silver primer, whereas all of the other ones have brass primers. 
the cartridge in that red box is a live bullet. So this was another live bullet that was found on the set, not just the one that was in Mr. Baldwin's firearm. Ultimately, you're gonna hear from us that there were not just these two, but a total of six live bullets that were found on the set, six. You're also gonna hear that all six of those live rounds have the same, uh, have common characteristics of having this silver or nickel covered primer, a shiny brass casing, and what's called a Starline brass head stamp. I don't know if you can tell in your monitors or not, but this, the, this impression that is on each of these cartridges, it looks like a star and then a line and a star. Uh, that, that indicates that it's a Starline brass manufactured casing. So we knew from the evidence gathered on October 21st, uh, and when we had these rounds uh, examined by the FBI, uh, we discovered that there were actually those six live rounds on set. And so our next step was to determine whether there was any way if we could tell when those live rounds ended up on the set. Um, so we began to comb through all of the photos and videos that had been recorded on the set from the very first day the filming began. And we started to notice something. We were able to identify several points in time where the cartridges with a silver primer and a, and a shiny brass cartridge ended up being spotted inside of the gun belts and bandoliers that the cast members were wearing on the set. Uh, in fact, we found a photograph where there was one occasion where a live round was sitting right on Ms. Gutierrez's lap and she failed to identify it. What you're looking now, <clears throat> what you're looking at now is a photograph of Ms. Gutierrez and on her lap, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that styrofoam uh, casing holder. I'm gonna show you a, a call-out that's been enhanced a little bit. And you can see, I hope you can see on your monitors, that these bullets here, kind of on the top right, appear to have a brass casing but these other, at least these other two bullets, most definitely uh, this cartridge that's in the blue circle, you can see that there is a silver primer um, on, that, uh, on that cartridge. And we believe uh, that that was a live bullet sitting on her lap and she failed to identify it. It's important that you know that this photograph was taken on October 10th. And the reason it's important for you to, to make note that this photograph was taken on October 10th is because the other dummy rounds that were purchased for this movie didn't even arrive to the set until October 12th. So this means that the, the live ammunition could not have been from the shipment that came in on October 12th uh, and that belonged or that was supplied by somebody other than uh, Ms. Gutierrez. This also will help you uh, when you hear from the defendant's counsel who are likely going to suggest to you that there was some kind of uh, sabotage on uh, a foot on the set or that the live rounds came from someone other than Ms. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez. This photograph, we think, uh, will help you conclude uh, that the live rounds were on set on the 10th and that the other, bullet, the other uh, dummy rounds didn't arrive until the 12th. We also have a little bit more evidence that these live rounds came onto the set via the defendant when she came to New Mexico from out of state. 
Um, as you can see from this photo, this is the box of rounds. This is kind of a blown up photograph of the box of rounds that she was pulling from on the day of the shooting. And you can see that it has a very specific label on it. It says 45 long Colt dummies. And then in much smaller print there in the middle, you can see the initials JS. So on November 9th, uh, a couple of weeks after the shooting, the defendant came into the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office uh, for an interview with Corporal Hancock, and she was asked questions about the box of ammunition she was pulling from the day of the uh, incident, this box with the small JS on the label. Uh, the defendant told Corporal Hancock that, the, that she thought this box was kind of peculiar and she wasn't certain where it came from, but she said that she didn't believe it was one of the uh, boxes that was originally brought on set. But then the defendant offered to Corporal Hancock that the day prior to the interview, she had asked her father back home uh, to text her a photograph of the box of 45 long Colt dummies that they had at his home. And she texted him, uh, and he texted her this photo in response. It's identical. It's the same box. The box of dummies she was pulling from on the 21st is identical to the box of dummies that her father had at home. So we believe this is more evidence that this box of dummies with the live round in it came from the defendant. We're also gonna show you how these live rounds slowly spread their way throughout the set, eventually landing in several of the actors' costumes and firearms on October 13th, 15th, 17th, and of course on the 21st. And the image on your screen now, you can see uh, in the, the large photograph that's the bandolier that Mr. Baldwin was wearing on the 21st. There is a live round inside of that bandolier. The black belt that's in the lower right-hand corner is a belt that was worn by another cast member. There's a live round in that belt too. The evidence you're gonna hear throughout this trial is that the defendant was unprofessional and that she failed to do the essential safety functions of her job, and that these failures resulted in live ammunition being spread throughout this entire set. Once the live ammunition was on the set, she failed to detect it because she didn't follow those essential safety protocols that required her to inspect every round before they were placed into the gun. The evidence will show that the defendant treated the safety protocols as if they were optional, rather than if people's lives counted on her doing her job correctly. Uh, we will show you that as a direct result of her failures, uh, Ms. Gutierrez call caused Ms. Hutchins' death. The last, or I should say the second crime <clears throat> that Ms. Her Ms. Gutierrez has been charged with is tampering with evidence. The evidence with regard to this charge is a lot more simple, a lot simpler. Um, you're gonna hear testimony that on the day that Ms. Hutchins was killed and after the defendant left her interview at the sheriff's office, she went back to her, her, she went back to her hotel. Um, knowing that the defendant had probably been through a lot that day, one of her crewmates went to her room to check on her to see how she was doing. Um, and after they were done visiting, uh, the crew member, got, crew member got up to leave, and as she was walking out of the room, the defendant, the defendant handed her something and asked her to hang on to it for her. At first, this crew member didn't really realize what she had been handed, so she walked out of the room, started down the hallway, and when she looked into her hand, she realized she had been handed a baggie of suspected cocaine from the defendant. Uh, she will testify that she was surprised that the defendant, who is somebody she hardly knew, 
would hand her a bag of suspected cocaine to hang on to, hang on to for her. Uh, the crew member is going to testify that she disposed of the cocaine. She didn't want to be caught with it, so she just threw it away. Um, and you're going to hear that the defendant over the next several weeks texted this crew member several times asking her to return her stuff, which the uh, crew member is going to testify is in reference to the baggie of cocaine. I know I've gone through a lot of uh, information with you guys, and, and I hope you're not too overwhelmed, uh, but that's why we're going to spend the next couple of weeks with you going over all of this evidence in a lot more detail. Uh, you're going to hear from a multitude of law enforcement officers. You're going to hear from firearms experts. You're going to hear from four FBI analysts covering the topics of fingerprints, DNA, explosives comparisons, and firearms testing. You're going to hear from an image enhancement uh, expert. And most importantly, you're going to hear from witnesses who worked with Ms. Gutierrez every day on the movie set, uh, including the film's director and several of the crew members who were inside the church on the day of this horrific incident. We're confident that after you hear from these witnesses and after you have an opportunity to look at the evidence for yourself in greater detail, you will agree with us that the defendant's actions were not only negligent on October 21st, but on many days leading up to the 21st. Uh, we hope that after you review this information, uh, you will find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And after reviewing and hearing from the witness concerning the tampering charge, uh, we believe that you will also uh, convict her on the tampering with evidence charge as well. I'm about done, but I do want to leave you with one final statement, and this is a statement that Ms. Gutierrez made uh, when she was being interviewed on the day of the shooting. She says at the end, I just, I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. And so do we. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, before we t take yours, I think we'll take a bathroom break, okay? So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Um, so go ahead, George, stand. All rise. All right, you may be seated. Um, why, why don't we uh, get back here at uh, 20 of? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, thank you. We're going to
Council, will you approach?
You may be seated. Mr. Foles. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, yes. counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are privileged, our team, to represent Hannah Gutierrez Reed. He's sitting over here. And we're here because of a tragedy, there's no doubt. There was a tragic uh, occurrence on that movie set. But let me tell you something you already know. Just because there was a tragedy does not mean that a crime was committed. It does not mean that Hannah Gutierrez Reed caused the crimes they have charged her with. And we are going to, through the course of this case, show you that production and the state very, uh, have both, very early on, sought to make Hannah Gutierrez Reed a scapegoat. That's what this is about. You're going to hear that this tragedy, several unconnected events, independent events had to happen to create it. First, the first event that had to happen is the actor, Alec Baldwin, pointed a gun on that set, and he either had his finger on the trigger and the hammer cocked, or he pulled the trigger as he was pointing that at Miss Hutchins and Mr. Souza, who was right behind her. And make no mistake, this is not a prop gun. This is a real gun. Mr. Baldwin pointed it right at him, either had his finger on the trigger and depressed, or pulled it, causing that gun to fire and hit Miss Hutchins. That's the first thing that had to happen. Miss Gutierrez Reed, you're not going to hear anything about her being in that church or firing that weapon. That was Alec Baldwin. You will hear that Hollywood actors are not allowed to point guns, real guns, at other actors or crew. It's, a, it's like every other uh, safety with guns in any other place in society. You learn these rules uh, and go into the classes. You learn these rules if you've ever owned a gun. Rule number one, never point a firearm at somebody unless you intend to shoot them. And that rule was broken. And that's going to be the first thing you're going to hear that, that caused this tragic accident. The second thing is that Hannah is being made a scapegoat for are deliberate errors and mistakes by production. So the opening counsel for the state talked about Ms. Gutierrez Reed and tried to put all of the onus on her. At the time, she was 24 years old. She had been hired for two duties, a props assistant, and you're going to hear what that is, and the armorer role, two different duties. So they were splitting her between those and making her, for example, roll cowboy cigarettes. That was one of them for the movie, and they had props that the actors have. And so she was having to do that to take away from her armorer duties. You're going to hear about that. Now, OSHA is a New Mexico agency, and that New Mexico agency inspected the movie and investigated this shooting, after the shooting. You're going to hear that OSHA found fault with production. They found numerous faults, numerous mistakes on production's part, not Ms. Gutierrez Reed on production. You're going to hear that OSHA indicated that there was a rush set that there were several safety errors, and I'm going to talk about those in a moment, but I want to make that very clear. When the state talks about Ms. Gutierrez Reed being negligent, what really happened is production was negligent. Production put her in that position. They put her in the position of having two jobs, a props assistant and an armor, and expected a 24-year-old under really tough conditions to keep up with everything that was going on, and you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear that Ms. Gutierrez Reed emailed the production manager, Gabrielle Pickle, who's on the set. You're going to hear Gabrielle Pickle. And she asked her for more armor days. She said in this email, when I'm not able to focus on my armor duties, this is when mistakes happen. And she was, she was telling her this. Now, Ms. Pickle came back and said, no, we only have eight armor days, and that's all you're going to get. So. Out of the whole course in the movie, they didn't allow her to be an armorer and to perform those duties to the extent that she had to. 
And that's going to be a very important point too. They, they've moved her between two different things, props assistant and armor. Counsel for the state in his opening said that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed had the job of sourcing the ammo and sourcing the firearms on set. Now you're going to hear when you go through this about another name, and her name is Sarah Zachary. Sarah Zachary was the props head. So as the head of props department, she was Ms. Gutierrez-Reed's boss. In that role, Sarah Zachary had to source the ammunition and had to source the firearms. So that was not correct, what, what counsel stated in, in the opening. In reality, that was Sarah Zachary's job. Now you're gonna hear that what happened is those two worked together in conjunction. Hannah was, uh, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was supposed to be doing armor and then she was supposed to run over and help Sarah Zachary whenever she wanted the help on props. So a lot of what you're gonna hear is a chaotic scene created by production and forcing somebody to do these two different roles. You're gonna hear witnesses in this case, including professional armor that the state has hired and other people that'll tell you it's completely inadvisable and a terrible decision on a movie like this with so many guns that you have a part-time armor. It just is not a good idea, and that's a, a terrible idea, but that's what they did. Now, as counsel stated, you, you will hear that this scene in the church was a blocking. It was a getting ready for a rehearsal. So you're gonna hear that Miss um, Gutierrez-Reed had brought the gun to Mr. Halls, that Mr. Halls uh, never should have handled that weapon, and you're gonna see he had a lot of experience in movies, he knew better. He had the weapon, he did not uh, inspect that fully. And you're gonna see that Mr. Baldwin didn't inspect it at all. So when counsel showed you that video on the first part of it, when he's sitting in that pew and doing that cross draw, you're gonna hear about that. You're gonna hear how dangerous a seated cross draw is. Is one of the more dangerous draws you can do because you're pulling the weapon across your body and you can also pull it across other people. So you're gonna hear that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed specifically requested to train Mr. Baldwin in a cross draw. And you're also gonna hear that he did not do that training. He did not set that training up. So when this tragic shooting occurred, it was in the very motion of a cross draw. You're also going to hear that this scene, this blocking, didn't even, recall, didn't even require him to draw that weapon. So it was just going to be an extreme close-up scene of his hand pulling out of his holster. And they were going to focus on that, create tension in the scene in the movie. Uh, instead, for whatever reason, Mr. Baldwin pulled it out and it ends up being pointed right at Ms. Hutchins, the camera, uh, and Mr. Souza. You're also going to hear, we're going to talk about in the course of this case, there's Hollywood tricks. These guns should never be pointed at another person. That instead what should happen is there's camera tricks that you can use to make it look like it's pointed, but it's not. There's also things we're going to talk about that, that Mr. Baldwin did at that moment that he violated and safety rules. Our gun and ammunition expert, Mr. Kuski, who you're going to hear from, is going to discuss safe gun handling and usage and go through safety bulletins. These safety bulletins apply on this set to movie actors, and he's going to talk about that. Second, let me talk about the live rounds. Now, the government has a, the state has a relatively new theory, which is based totally on pictures, and you saw some of those pictures, and it's also based on the idea that live rounds have a silver primer on this set. So that's gonna be the core of their argument and their theory. And you saw in the picture, one of them had a silver primer. And the primer is just that circle in the middle of the round on the back where the hammer hits and that's what caused the round to fire. Now, what, what you didn't hear in State's opening was that there's gonna be numerous dummy rounds that also have silver primers that were on this set. There was a FBI report you're gonna see that a box removed from the prop truck had 16 silver primer dummies 
and one silver primer suspected live round. So this was a box found in the prop truck. So the theory that all the silver primer rounds are live is not correct. It's just not true. So you're going to hear during the course of this evidence, because of these silver primer dummies, that theory does not work. Second, you're going to hear that Rust Production ordered all the dummies on set. Rust Production sourced these primarily from a man named Seth Kinney. Seth Kinney owned PDQ Props. PDQ Props was the primary supplier to the Rust set. Now you're going to hear that, that after the shooting, Seth Kinney was extremely active in contacting the sheriffs and trying to work with them and trying to point the finger away from himself. And you're going to hear about that. You're also going to hear that Sarah Zachary, who I told you about earlier, after the shooting, she sent a text to Seth Kenny and it said emergency. Now, Sarah Zachary works for Seth Kenny and PDQ Props. She worked on set, but she was under him. She sent a text to Seth Kenny saying emergency. You're then going to hear that they had a phone call very shortly after. This is just minutes after the shooting. Sarah and Seth are talking on the phone. Now, we don't have that actual phone call, but whatever was said, here's what happened very, the very next thing. Sarah Zachary goes over and removes rounds from two of the weapons, two of the actor's guns, and she throws them away. Now, that's absolute and complete scene tampering. And when she first was interviewed by the sheriff, Sarah Zachary said, I was panicked, and that's all I can tell you. Now, I expect in the course of this case, you're going to hear that when she was interviewed, she's going to say something like, I threw them away because that's what we do after scenes. And you're going to get to evaluate her credibility and determine why would these be thrown away they're, if they're dummy rounds. They're rounds that can be reused. They cost money. It doesn't make sense. You would just throw them away. And what was the real reason Sarah Zachary threw those rounds away right after her call with Seth Kenny? Now, you're also going to hear that right after the shooting, Sarah Zachary went over and she shook some rounds and determined that they didn't shake, meaning she felt like they were live rounds. So then she throws these away. Now they're thrown in trash. She tells law enforcement, but they, on that day, they don't find them. Uh, but they're on a, they, she threw them in trash right by the prop truck, you're gonna hear, but they didn't find them. So we don't have those rounds. And you're not gonna be able to hear this in the course of this case or see them, see what Sarah Zachary threw away. You're not gonna be able to have that because they were never recovered. That's scene tampering. You're also gonna hear another instance of scene tampering um, that Sarah Zachary carried items from the prop cart. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that prop cart. Right after the shooting, she carried items to the prop truck. So she moved items from the cart, knowing there had been a shooting, knowing law enforcement's gonna be here, to the prop truck. So the other problem with the state's theory now and showing you that picture of those boxes and Benavita's truck and how they were kept on the seat is that we don't know what was taken from the cart completely. What we do know is that one box, Seth Kinney's box, appeared and was found in the prop truck. And we know that Sarah Zachary transported items from the prop cart to the prop truck. We know that. But we're never going to know exactly what was on that cart at the time of the shooting because it was tampered with. We're also not going to know because you're going to see on, on Officer Benavides' lapel video that right after the shooting, Miss Gutierrez Reed was taken into his vehicle and segregated. She was segregated from all the other witnesses. She's sitting in his vehicle. Uh, uh, Officer Benavides feels, Deputy Benavides, 
feels like he has to stay with Miss Gutierrez Reed because she's distraught. So he tells another person to go get the prop cart. The prop cart is over by the church. He tells somebody else to walk over and get it. Now, I think he's going to acknowledge that he should have gone, gone and got that prop cart. Problem with that is this is just a random, uh, this is not a law enforcement, not random, we know who it is, but this is law enforcement's job to secure the scene. After a shooting like this, you don't want evidence to go walking away. You don't want it to go missing. You don't want it because we're here on a reasonable doubt standard. That standard is the highest standard under our, under our law. That means you can't convict somebody in this country, no matter who they are, unless you prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And what we've got here is theories based on evidence that has already been tampered with. And you're going to hear that in this case. That's not even going to be questioned. So you're going to have to take the leap that whatever Sarah took to the prop trip, we don't know. And whatever she did with those rounds, we don't know. And you may not know why. But I can tell you, it occurred right after the call with Seth Kenny, And you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear about his contacts with, with a uh, witness named Del Reed. Del Reed is the father of Miss Gutierrez Reed. Del Reed is one of the most renowned armorers in the history of movies. You're going to hear that he's been doing this for over 50 years. He's trained Brad Pitt, Sharon Stone, Denzel Washington. He did Tombstone. Some of you might have seen that. He did 310 to Yuma. He's the real deal. And you're going to hear that he trained Miss Gutierrez Reed. She was very well trained. She also went to film school and she completed a bachelor's degree in that. So you're going to see that she was trained, she was educated, and she was ready for this job. Now, it was her, her second job as head armor. You're going to hear that she had, had one prior. And she had also worked as an assistant on another movie. But you're going to hear that from the time she was a little girl, her dad, Thel Reed, had her on these movie sets, and he was training her. Now, Thel, the reason why I mention him is, is he and Seth Kinney, right before Russ started, were on another movie set called Yellowstone 1883, and that occurred in Texas. You're going to hear that Thel Reed brought live rounds. These were 45 Colt live rounds to Texas, and he and Seth Kinney were going to train the actors on a, on a range, not on the set, but on a range. So they sometimes train these actors to fire the weapon and see how the recoil is and kind of get a feel for it for the, the, the movie scene. So he brought these live rounds. They did the training. They did Yellowstone 83. And then Seth Kinney kept these live rounds in an ammo can. He did not give them back to Thel Reed. And again, you're going to see these were 45 Colt live rounds. Fast forward. Wasn't that much longer, within months, that we have rest set. And Seth Kinney is the primary supplier of ammunition to the rest set. You're going to see evidence in this case that Seth Kinney's rounds in a box that the sheriffs found uh, were blue. They were a certain color. And, and we'll remind you, as, as we go through, we'll highlight that. But they were a certain color. And you're going to see, for example, on the picture that the state showed you in their opening, the live round they said that was in that gun belt, it's the same color. And you're going to be able to put that together as the evidence comes through. It's the same color as the rounds that Seth had that were blued. You're also going to hear that that the sheriff's investigation, they never took Seth Kenny's fingerprints. They never took his DNA. They didn't take his cell phone. So again, we're going to be missing evidence. Knowing that Seth Kenny was the primary ammunition supplier, knowing that he and Sarah Zachary had talked right after the shooting, Sarah had thrown rounds away, Sarah had moved stuff from the prop truck, none of Seth Kenny's phone, Fingerprints or DNA were taken. And you're also going to hear that there was no request to the FBI to check those live rounds for fingerprints or DNA. None. So the FBI lab was 
requested to do a bunch of forensic tests. They were testing the, the firearm Mr. Baldwin used to see if it functioned correctly. You're going to hear about other tests they did, but no testing on the live rounds. Zero. Again, that's going to be evidence that you are never going to see or have because the government didn't do it. And again, we have a reasonable doubt standard. Our expert, Mr. Kuski, is going to talk about the government's theory, state's theory, about these colors and, and the rounds. And I talked about that earlier briefly, but I'm just going to say it again because it's so important. You cannot tell a live round from a dummy by a picture. And the reason for that is that the dummies are made in Hollywood to look just like live rounds. Now, that the point of that is the people watching the movie don't know that it's not it's, that it's a dummy. They're made to look just like a live round. Now, the picture Council for the State showed earlier showed a, a hole in that round. That is how they make some of the dummies. It's not how they make all the dummies. Some of the dummies, unfortunately, do not shake and they do not have a hole in them. And you're going to hear that one of those rounds was on this set. It's going to be in the CSI Tech, uh, Ms. Ms. Popple. It's in her report. Uh, it's called the Denix round from Spain. That round did not shake. So that's a dummy that looks like a live round and it does not shake with the BB, so you can tell. Mr. Kuski is going to talk about how this is highly dangerous and how Ms. Gutierrez Reed was faced with the situation on this set of dealing with a mixed match of dummies, cheap dummies, he's going to call garbage, that were just thrown together that she had to deal with. Again, while OSHA is going to tell you she's being rushed, she's having to perform two jobs, she's asking for more resources and help from her manager, and she's not getting it. Third, you're going to hear that David Halls, the first assistant director, that he's going to say Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was doing a good job. Now he's going to, and she did good with safety on set. He was the first assistant director. He was the one that took the firearm and handed it to Baldwin. You're going to hear testimony that he never should have had that firearm, never. You're going to hear from a director, P.J. Pesh, who's done movies for over 30 years. P.J. Pesh uh, has done, all, you're going to hear about all his credits. He's worked on all kinds of movies. He's going to tell you that, that he's never seen a first assistant director in all those movies ever handle a weapon and hand it to the actor. This was a highly, highly unusual setup and management created by production. That was their fault. And what they've tried to do, and what you're seeing in this courtroom today, is trying to blame it all on Hannah, the 24-year-old, because why? Because she's an easy target. She's the least powerful person on that set. So what do we do? And you're going to see the evidence. They target her. You're also going to hear that David Halls he did not address prior safety issues. And this is part of the thing that OSHA found. David Halls, there were two accidental or negligent discharges on set. And what that is, is Sarah Zachary had one of them, and a stunt double for Baldwin had another one. What those are, you have a firearm with a blank in it, and you don't either uh, decock it, it's called, where you put the hammer down slowly so it doesn't fire, you don't do that right, and then it goes off unexpectedly. Uh, Sarah Zachary did that. The second one you're going to hear, a stunt double had a misfire, and these were on the same day, five days before the shooting, October 16th, the same day within an hour apart. Ms. Gutierrez really addressed it by talking to both of them because these are safety incidents. You can't have misfires like this, uh, negligent discharges like this. People are walking around, they don't have air protection. These blanks can actually fire off stuff out of smoke and everything that can uh, 
it's dangerous. So David Halls did not do anything about it. Again, that's his job. You're going to hear that he was the security coordinator for the entire set. But David Halls didn't delay. He didn't order additional training. You're going to hear some of the head people, if you hear from them in this trial, for Russ Production, some of the head guys, they didn't even know about it. So they weren't informed about it. That's how much the production cared about safety. Because you know what the primary thing was here? It was rush, get this done so we can get the money. And that's all on production. And Mr. Baldwin is one of the primary producers. That's on them. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed had no control over that. Finally, you're going to hear from OSHA that Rust Production didn't adhere to several safety rules that they have to adhere to on set. That's why they were fined. They gave them the largest fine in the history of New Mexico over this case because of what they did. You're going to hear that they didn't have a procedure to ensure live rounds were not brought into set. Nor did they give Ms. Zachary or Ms. Gutierrez-Reed enough time to thoroughly inventory. You're going to hear that Halls did not conduct daily safety meetings, and there was no safety instruction prior to Baldwin using the gun in the church. You're going to hear that Russ failed to accord Ms. Gutierrez-Reed more training days, and she was not able to train Baldwin on the cross draw. And you're going to hear again that Mr. Baldwin one of the lead producers, head actor in the movie, who really controlled the set, you're going to hear that he violated some of the most basic gun safety rules you can ever learn. From a young age, we all learn you don't point a gun at somebody ever unless you want to shoot them. You treat all guns as loaded, and you keep your finger out of the trigger until you're ready to shoot. He violated all those. It wasn't Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, that was Mr. Baldwin. Now you're going to hear from some other witnesses. There's going to be a lot of them, but the core principles at the end are you're going to be missing critical evidence. You're going to not hear about Seth Kenny because the government didn't investigate him. They chose not to. Mr. Kenny, primary ammo supplier, Talking with Sarah Zachary, she's throwing stuff away. They didn't go after him. They went after Miss Gutierrez Reed. And you can think about that. Why would they do that? Miss Gutierrez Reed did the best job she could under very, very tough circumstances, trying to get into this profession, a profession she really wanted to do. She was trained by her dad, a longtime armor. 24 years old. She had insufficient time to do her armor duties because she was also forced to do props. And management made a number of mistakes and did not create the proper atmosphere. Rust production in the state want to scapegoat her. She is not guilty of the crimes charged against her. And the, the prosecution must prove that beyond a reasonable doubt and I submit they will not in this trial for the reasons I've stated and the evidence that you will see. All right, thank you. As requested by the <coughs> council on directing any, any uh, uh, one that's going to be called as a witness in this case, including an expert witness as stipulated by the um, uh, council that none of these witnesses may be viewing this trial live stream on court TV. Uh, call your first witness. Your Honor, the state calls Nicholas Dwork. All right. <coughs>
Have you advised um, Grace? I'll, I'll use that word. I'll take care of it. Right. Thank you. We did previously, but I'll but, yeah. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. All right, have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Good. Uh, would you please state your name for the record and spell your last name? Um, Officer Nicholas Lafleur, and then my last name is spelled L-E-F-L-E-U-R. Right. Officer Lafleur, how are you currently employed? I'm currently employed in uh, the city of Santa Fe. And how long have you worked for the city of Santa Fe? Um, going on two years. And and what is your role at the city of Santa Fe? I'm a police officer. All right. Um, prior to uh, working at the Santa Fe uh, Police Department, uh, where were you employed? With the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. All right. And is that where you were employed on October 21st, 2021? Yes, sir. All right. Um, and. On October 21st, 2021, were you called out to the Rust movie set? Yes, sir. Um, how did you receive that call? It came over the radio as I was um, in close proximity. Did you receive any information as part of that call? Um, that someone had been shot on a movie set. All right. And what did you do in response to that call? Um, got, got there as safely and as quickly as I could. And when you arrived to the set, were there any other uh, law enforcement personnel there? I was the first one there. I believe there was a, a volunteer firefighter uh, unit in front of me. Okay. And when you when you arrived on the set, where did you arrive? Um, right in front of the uh, church they had set up as a prop piece. Okay. And on that day, were you wearing a, a lapel camera or a body-worn camera? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move for admission of States Exhibit 1 that's been stipulated to by counsel. All right. States 1. Um, may I have permission to publish it to the jury? Yes. And do you do we want to do a reminder to cut the live stream? This is I that video. Did you did. This is the okay. one you need to cut the live stream. Thank you.
like this. Okay. Ah. Start the video back from the beginning. Yeah, I'm trying to get it out. Uh, stupid new truck. Are we going to side with the BBMs? Can everybody hear it? out of your truck what's happening in that portion of the clip we just watched um, so I arrive, arrive on scene um, go around to my passenger seat where I keep the uh, shooting trauma kit hand it to what I believe was uh, one of the volunteer firefighters and then have some trouble with everything that's locked because it was a new unit and everything uh, which wasn't used to pulling it out as fast. And then I go retrieve a, a BVM kit. It's a bag yeah. valve mask um, for airway purposes to help the, an individual get oxygen. Okay. Thank you.
please, um, Ryan, will you go get Grace? Will you go get Grace? Approach the bench with counsel. Okay, so um, why don't you be back downstairs at uh, 1230? Would that work for you all? Okay, so uh, follow George's directions, but you know where to go on the first floor and wait for George, okay? Thank you. All Please rise. don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're in recess.
Bailiffs have asked me to remind you to wear your badges so that they know whether you're press or public. You ready? Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor.
All right, you may be seated. Thank you. I will, as a uh, request for counsel, uh, I remind anyone that's going to be called as a witness in this case uh, is not to be viewing this trial live stream on court TV. Thank you. Shall we continue? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience. We think we have this worked out now. We've managed to work a bypass through the system, so we're going to plow forward. Um, what I. Oh, it's off. Better? Thank you. Um, we're going to plow forward. I'm going to start the video from the beginning. We only got about a couple of minutes in, and I know there was a lot of start and stops, so I'm going to start from square one with you all. Um, Officer LaFleur is back, and we're going to pick up with the video. You got your, you got your trauma kit? Yeah, I'm trying to get it out. This stupid new truck. I'll be inside with the BBMs. We sent him to get another Bluetooth speaker so that this one doesn't run out. Um, the problem is that there is a there's a compatibility issue with the video app and the court system. So we can play this video just fine on our computers and it never freezes. But when we connect to this, we get a freezing okay. problem. Um, we'll try it. Let's try it again. We're going to try it again. It's not up there. Okay. Here. I'll be inside with the BBMs. Explain to us what you're getting out of your truck. Um, in the beginning, from the passenger seat, it's a trauma kit. And then from the back of the truck, it's uh, a bag full of uh, other medical supplies to include a BBM, the bag valve mask, 
system okay. and to help with CPR. Okay, thank you. A seal? A seal. Uh, uh, I got a sterile glove and a packing glass. Okay. Where was she shot at? She came in here and went across her chest. And came okay. out the back and went into him. You want air, air flight? Yeah, we all went in wraps. Okay. 32 Santa Fe, one female shot in the chest, male shot in the stomach, request an air flight. Are you using your Apple still? That's that's what uh, the question is. We are, and we're about to disconnect from the Apple and get on a Windows Surface Pro. Okay, that's because I was asking if we could, if there was a computer that you all, all could use in the courthouse, and if you're using the Surface Pro, then that's okay. Okay. Do you want me to try to find a computer? No, we got it. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shot in the stomach, request an air flight. 
Okay, officer, who are you speaking to uh, when you're on your radio? Whichever dispatcher is. Whichever dispatcher was on the radio at the time. Okay, great. And what what information generally are you providing to them? Uh, patient update and any additional medical any additional services I'm I'm in need of. Okay, thank you. So I believe I heard you ask here, do you need a BPM? Uh, B BVM, it's the um, back valve mass that I referred to earlier. Okay, thank you. So are, are, are these your arms that we can see holding that yellow BVM? Yes, sir. Okay. And can you explain to the jury exactly what you're doing here? Um, well, in the beginning, you can see um, I'm making sure that there's airflow coming through, and then I orientate it to correctly fit over her nose and mouth. And at this point, the bag isn't needed because there's an oxygen supply going through. So I'm just holding it there so she gets accurate uh, oxygen levels. Okay, thank you. Is anybody allowed to go with her? And no, no. Elena, deep breath, deep breath, Elena. There you go. Deep breath, deep breath, Elena. Deep breath. Deep breath. Deep breath. Be okay. Good girl, good girl. Okay. There you go, good girl. that item you just unwrapped? No, it looked like a surgical gauze bag. Okay. Got a stretcher? Yeah. Uh, not yeah, me here, here, no. Here. Okay. Ah. Let me help him get the stretcher. Ah. Right. Yeah. Stretcher. Ah. Pay attention. Yeah, yeah. So, here's part of it, number one. Okay. 
Who is the gentleman that just walked into the frame? That would be Lieutenant uh, Benavides. Okay, and was he your supervisor? He was uh, a supervisor that day, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. To the test, and then y'all one and y'all over there. And I believe I heard you say that she got a through and through to her, and you got one in the arm over there. What What did you mean? Um, that Miss that the female uh, had been shot and had gone through her, and the uh, male who was laying there had um, been hit in the neck, in the arm sh shoulder area. Okay, thank you. Everybody stops what they're doing right now. This is a crime scene. Okay. Okay, roll back. 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 Roll here what's the ETA on the bird this may be an obvious question but would you explain to the jury what you're referring to when you're asking about the bird um, about how long the helicopter air flight was going to take to get there okay thank you
Can you explain to us a little bit about what you're doing here? Um, trying to stay stay busy, trying to organize and think ahead about what we're going to need. Um, telling people that are just obviously that we're there to corral in one area um, to wait for the next steps. Okay, thank you. Asking these folks for their IDs because uh, it was apparent they were in there um, when I got there and they were still in there when I went back in um, they could have been possible witnesses and people I need to or not myself but people who need to be talked to okay thank you outside wait for the investigators to get here okay cool, cool. This is my and who's the props guy Who's in charge of props? She has green and purple hair. You can't miss her. Okay. All right. 
you hear them mention the props guy being a female with green and purple hair? Yes. Okay, were you able to identify who that was? Uh, not me personally, no. Okay. Not at the time. Okay, thank you. I was on, I was here when it happened. You were here when it happened? Yes, sir. Who else was here when it happened? Uh, my uh, 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 the the camera right. operator. Uh, How many people do you think were in here when it happened? Uh, three, maybe four. Four? Maybe. Okay. So two more other than you two? Reed, as soon as I see him, he Reed. was the camera operator. Reed, yes sir. Okay, who else? Reed Russell was here. Uh, Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin was the actor on set that pulled the trigger. Alec Baldwin? Yes sir. Where's he at? How's it going, sir? Um, so, uh, my understanding, um, you, were you were in the room when the lady when the was shot? The gun, yeah. Okay, alrighty. Um, well, I, I know your name, so I think it's, it's, it's uh, um, Jay. Let me back, okay? Let me give up. All right. You indicated you already knew what his name was. Who, can you identify this man for us? Uh, Alec Baldwin. Thank you. I want you to, I want you to hang out, okay? Uh, whatever you want to do. Right? Yes, sir. All right, give me just a sec. All right. Thankfully, that's where the video ends. Uh, at least the portion we're going to watch today. Um, so after you spoke to Mr. Baldwin, uh, what did you do next? Um, I believe one of the people I named in my report, I can't remember what you... Um, was able to give me names and people who were uh, in the room during the, during the incident. And uh, I did my best to find those individuals and kind of corral them all into one area um, with the resources we had. Okay, uh, talk, about a talk about that a little bit. Um, what resources did you have on hand at this point in time? Um, at this point in time, there was only three deputies to include myself, a uh, lieutenant and a corporal. Okay. And approximately how many people were you needing to uh, corral? Uh, at that time, it was unknown, but there was um, the numbers were n not not in our favor. So, um, a couple hundred people were there, that can total on the whole scene. Okay. And do you have an approximation of how many you ended up uh, kind of corralling off? I think maybe ten, without looking at the report. But okay. Um, once you had the folks corralled, what what was the what were your next steps? Um, as more resources got there, we just um, just trying to figure out where they're going to take all these people, how we're going to get them there, where they're going to start conducting interviews because we're out in the middle of nowhere essentially. Okay, and uh, did was that pretty much conclude uh, your involvement that day? Um, once once you had everybody corralled. Yeah, just the rest of my moment was keeping people crowded and then um, staying with people as they were changed out to be interviewed and uh, ultimately was in a um, one of the trailers. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Cross-exam. Of course. There you go. Good afternoon, sir. How long have you been working as a law enforcement officer uh, when this happened? Um, going on four years. Four years. Had you ever been to a homicide scene before? Nothing as complex as that one, no. Okay. And. You've received some additional law enforcement training uh, since this incident after you went to work at the Santa Fe Police Department, right? Yes. Um, would you agree with me that a primary goal uh, for you as the first responding investigator would be to identify and preserve evidence? I would have to disagree. Okay. Explain your disagreement, please. My primary role is um, life before evidence, um, to preserve life. 
and then investigate and preserve evidence. Okay, and we saw you helping with that. Thank you for your efforts there. Uh, after that was done, what steps, if any, did you take to identify and preserve evidence? Um, what, what, little, what limited um, capabilities I had at the time, um, judging that it was only three of us on scene, um, tried to gather information as to who was in there um, and keep them all in one area. Okay. And you would agree with me that in the initial stages of a criminal investigation, it's important to identify and preserve evidence. Yes. Okay. And we heard on your lapel video, uh, as life-saving efforts for Ms. Hutchins were being made, uh, that your lieutenant very loudly declared that this is a crime scene. Yes. You, you heard that, right? So, at that time... Yes. Okay. So, at, at that time, you guys are should be thinking also about identifying and preserving evidence, right? To a point, yes. Okay. Now, would you also agree with me that it is important to identify witnesses uh, to a crime or potential crimes and take steps to preserve the value of their testimony? Yes. Okay. And one of the ways that you do that is by avoiding what's called witness taint. Would you agree with that? If you're referring to um, separating the witnesses, yes. Okay. And that's one way that you make sure the witness's memory and perception of the event doesn't become influenced by someone else's, right? You can yes. make sure that they're not able to talk to anyone else. Yes. Okay. And as part of your training uh, and investigations, you're aware that taint can sometimes be accidental or incidental. People are sharing their recollections about an event. Have you been taught that? Yes. Have you also been taught that sometimes uh, witness taint can be purposeful? For instance, if people were to talk and say, okay, we're gonna get details X, Y, and Z correct. And I'm not talking about this case in particular, just in general, your training. Have you been taught that? It's a possibility. Okay. You've been instructed that it's a possibility. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to separate witnesses so that can't happen. Yes. Okay. So, in your testimony, you indicated that you were corralling uh, the witnesses. What exactly does that mean? Um, with limited space and area <laughs> where it happened. I was trying to keep everybody in one area. Um, it was a one building surrounded by a um, bunch of movie set equipment. We were very limited on back seats. Um, There's only three units there. So. Okay. You didn't corral them in the church, did you? No. Okay. Um, it looked like there's a lot of open space there. Would you agree with that? Yes. All right. Could you have told the people just to go stand, you know, somewhere under some shade apart from one another? I did have them stand in the shade, which right. was where they were at. I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is why didn't you have them separate? Why do you have them stay together? Again, I was, there's only three officers on scene at that time. I'm trying to keep them all on my site um, and in close proximity. Okay. Did you tell them not to speak to one another? I did ask they... them several times to stop talking. And Okay. Did you hear that on the video that we just watched? No, that video is redacted. It doesn't show the whole length of the body camera. Okay. Did you identify who all was in the church? To my recollection from the report I did, okay. based off of the script um, writer who was in charge of like, who's in the room, like camera-wise and actor-wise. 
All right. What individuals were inside the church when the shooting happened? Um, my memory's not that great to name everybody individually. case, right? Yes. With looking at your report, refresh your recollection as to who was in the church? Yes. All right. I've provided you a copy of your report. Let me know if that refreshes your recollection. Yeah, I'm reading 12 different names. But all, right. Uh, all right. Who all was in the church? Um, a cert, I'm going to butcher these names, but uh, Sergio Sinto, labeled as a chief lighting technician. Uh, Duran Curtin as a costume, Ross, I uh, don't want to say the last name, but uh, I guess his title would be Dolly Grip, Mamie Mitchell, which uh, script supervisor, Matthew Hammer, assistant chief lighting technician, Joseph Zelo, key rigging, David Halls, first assistant director, uh, Reese Price, key grip, Thomas Gaddy, special effects coordinator, Roman Gaddy, uh, Special Effects Key, Lucas Hussack, Special Effects Technician, and Alec Baldwin, Actor. Thanks. Judge Connor, Richard, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If you need to look at your report again, let me know. <coughs> All right. Uh, I heard on the Palo video, initially you were told three or four people were in the church. Yes. All right. After hearing that, what did you do? Um, tried to figure out who exactly was in the church by asking several different people and eventually ending up with that list. Okay. And you ultimately crowd all those individuals together? Yes. Okay. And is it your testimony that there was no other way to have them situated, that they had to be together? Um, not No other way, but that was the way that was they were placed. Okay. And would you agree with me that ideally that should not have happened in this case? I mean, if you're Monday morning quarterbacking it, um, ideally we'd be able to place handcuffs on everybody and separate them individually in each car. But with the limited resources and all right, do you recall giving a pretrial interview in this case? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, in your interview, you mentioned the benefit of hindsight. You kind of approached that topic, uh, talking about Monday morning quarterbacking. Uh, looking at the case now, with the benefit of hindsight and your additional training, is there anything else you would do? Is there anything you would do differently? There's quite a few things I would have done differently. What things would you have done differently? Um, separated everybody um, further apart. Um, attempted to get um, everybody's. Uh, Re disposable cuffs, um, collect phones, stuff like that. Okay. And you actually told my investigator you'd do the scene completely differently. Yes. All right. And is one of the reasons you would do that differently is that you're now aware of the valuable evidence that can be found on cell phones? Um. One of the reasons would be um, the more uh, training that I've received and experience. Okay. Uh, when you approached Mr. Baldwin, was he on his phone? Yes. All right. After you spoke with him, did you tell him to stay off of his phone? I believe so. 
Okay. Did, um, not in that video, no. But did you take his phone from him? No, I did not. Why didn't you take his phone? Um, during that portion of my career, I wasn't, um, I guess, knowledgeable on the fact of um, what cell phones provided and um, the uh, availability to detain and um, secure people's cell phone devices. Okay. Uh, aside from the witnesses speaking to one another, was there anything else that was happening on this uh, movie set that could have affected uh, what they told investigators later about what they saw? I'm not too sure. Could you rephrase that? Yeah. As we sit here today, and having looked at your video, and hopefully having done some prep for this trial, is there any other thing that you can think of aside from the witnesses being corralled together that could affect the statements that they gave to investigators? Other than being placed apart and um, separate, I don't think. Okay. Do you recall uh, an attorney who was present at this movie set? I do remember somebody claiming to be an attorney um, for the movie set. I don't okay. remember her name. And she specifically identified herself as an attorney for the production company? Yes. All right. And what was she telling people? Um, I can't Judge remember at the time. Yes. Judge, it goes to, do you want to argue here or approach? It doesn't matter, whichever you all are more comfortable with. Uh, Judge goes to the effect on the listener and what he did, and it's highly relevant, but it's not offered literally for the truth of the matter asserted. Well, I'd have to see what it is. Approach. What was the attorney on the movie set doing? Speaking to people who were um, potentially involved or seen, asking them what they seen, I believe. I didn't really hear all the conversations he was having. Okay. Have you ever been to a crime scene uh, where an attorney shows up and starts talking to witnesses before the police do? No. Okay. And would you agree with me that uh, talking to a legal representative of some entity, in this case the movie production, uh, could that have affected the statements that the witnesses gave later to police? There's a possibility of it, yes. Okay. Why did you not take steps to stop that from happening? 
because um, I wasn't the one investigating uh, them individually, right, reading them the Miranda rights at the time. Were you aware that this was a problem at the time as you observed it? Not at the time, no. It's something you've become aware of by virtue of your training now? Yes. Uh, nothing further. Thank you. Uh, thank you, officer. Uh, do you need a warrant to search a phone? Yes. And this, well, it, yes. Okay. And did you have a warrant on this thing? Uh, judge, objection. I talked about a season of phone, not search. Those are very different concepts. I can rephrase. Okay. Uh, did you did you have a warrant to seize the phone? No, I did not have a warrant to seize the phone. Okay, and was it your job to get a warrant? Not at that time, no. Okay. Um, have you ever been to a crime scene with 200 witnesses before? No. Okay. And uh, have you ever been to a crime scene that was on a movie set before? No. All right. Nothing further. All right, thank you. This witness is excused. Next witness. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next witness the state calls is uh, Tim Benavides. He should be on his way in. Do you swear or firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, All right, thank you. Have a seat talking to the microphone. Sir, how are you currently employed? I am not. Congratulations. <laughs> Why are you not employed? Uh, I retired from the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office in July. In July, okay. Yeah. Uh, and how are you employed on October 21st of 2021? I was a lieutenant with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office, day shift commander. Give us an idea of your uh, background and experience uh, in terms of your law enforcement experience. Um, I did 20 years with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. Um, 
going through the ranks from deputy to lieutenant. How many years? 20 years. And did you have any law enforcement experience before going to the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department? Uh, I did not. Okay. And how did you become involved in uh, the incident on October 21st, 2021 at Bonanza Creek Ranch? Um, I was a day shift commander. Um, we had gotten dispatched to the Bonanza Creek Ranch. What did you think you were being dispatched to? Um, dispatch advised that there was a accidental shooting with a prop gun. And what did you do when you received that information? Um, due to the nature of the call, I activated my lights and sirens and I uh, proceeded to the movie ranch. And Tell us what you saw when you arrived. What was going on? Describe the scene to us. Um, coming upon the movie ranch, um, there is security. Um, um, the movie ranch is quite large. Uh, one of the security guards at the time uh, told, told us uh, that to follow him in because it was, it was uh, quite large, the, the movie set. Um, as soon as we got to the movie set itself, um, it was chaos. There was people everywhere. Um, Deputy LaFleur was already on scene. I didn't know where he was. And I was bring, being directed to the um, makeshift church. And sir, did you, um, did you also have a body-worn camera? Yes, I did. And did you run your body worn camera? Uh, from the time I activated my lights um, to head to the movie ranch, it was activated. So, is there a fair portion of your body worn camera that is you driving your car? Yes, there is. Uh, I was on the other side of the county, of Santa Fe County, when the call came in. So, it took me, I believe, 16 minutes to get to the call. And after you arrived on scene, did you make contact with anyone? Um, with the security guard and then um, myself and the corporal at the time, Corporal Alderete, um, we made contact at the church. And was Corporal Alderete there before you? I believe me and him went in at the same time. So prior to you and Corporal Alderete arriving, uh, was it just Deputy LaFleur? Yes, it was. So was there a way to effectively separate the witnesses at that point in time? There was not with three deputies on scene. Um, we were trying to, um, at the time, find out how the victims were in the church um, and fire personnel was telling us for help to land the helicopter. So there was no way at the time we were trying to um, corral everybody and keep everybody corralled as much as possible to uh, as witnesses. Was one of the primary focuses uh, helping the injured people? That was our main focus as soon as we found out um, that we had enough fire personnel working on the victims. Uh, our next thing is to find out where the gun's at. And is that what you tried to do? Yes. Sir, have you had an opportunity to review uh, your the footage from your body-worn camera recently? Yes, I have. And I would like to move for the admission of States Exhibit 2. No objection. Um, and permission to publish. States 2 is admitted. You may publish. 
And we are going to start this video at 16 minutes and five seconds so that we don't spend 16 minutes watching him drive to the scene. Secure the, we're gonna secure the film and uh, all the crew members. Okay. Cool, thanks. I have like 200 people out here, so. Yes, I already called for them. Mr. Benavides, we heard you give some instructions uh, to that lady. Do you remember who that lady was? I do not remember who she was. Um, did you get an impression of whether she was someone in charge or not in charge? Um, I did. She was talking to Corporal Alderete. Um, I figured that she, she had to be somebody important, a director or something. And why were you telling her to do all these things? I think I was telling the corporal. Oh. Whoever was in charge, and I think she rose her hat, and then I directed to her. And what are you talking about in terms of securing the video? Why why would that be important? Well, I saw video behind the behind them, and they said they were filming. As you sit here today, are you aware uh, of whether or not there was actually uh, a video recording of the shooting? I don't know if there actually was. I never found out. And you were not the primary detective on the case, is that right? That is correct. I was okay. not. At this point in time, other than uh, providing aid to the people who've been shot, what's the most important piece of evidence that you're concerned about? Um, in my head at that time, I was thinking about where the gun was. Are you asking for pictures? Uh, trying to preserve the scene as much as possible. I know I'm wearing my body camera, but I'm trying to preserve everything I can. On this particular uh, scene, was that easy? It was not. <laughs> Where's the props guy? Where's the props guy at? We need to make sure that they're They're taking care of business. What else do you need there, Chief? What's my radio? It's just here. There, thank you, thank you. There's the gun. Where is it? Why are you asking for the props guy? Um, I think it was more of a guess to find out where the gun was. Okay. Oh, I'm just trying to find the gun. And did you hear that person screaming in the background? 
Yes, I do. Do you know who that person was? Uh, Joel. And why was Joel screaming? Because he was shot from what I saw. And the gentleman uh, who is standing right in front of you on the video screen there, um, uh, do you recall your interaction with him? I don't other than the video. Um, he just offered his services trying to find the, the props guy. Okay, he's a the guy there that tried to help you? Yes. Okay. I believe he's a director and he um, took me to the to a cart to a great cart and there was two guns on the cart and he he told me that those weren't the two guns used in the church at that time so not the gun you're looking for exactly discussion you're having what, what what are you asking about I'm asking about the gun um, if that was the right gun used she and she told me yes um, and then she's talking about the ammunition okay was the ammunition readily available right there it was not Why did you let that gentleman with the hat on go collect the rounds or the cart or whatever it was he said? I had three deputies on scene. I was taking care of the gun at the time and uh, the props person. Um, I had two other deputies trying to control their part of the scene. Um, I was keeping my eye as much as I can on the person going for the for the ammunition. Did he bring something back to you? He brought me the great cart that originally that we had gone and uh, we were looking for the gun that was used. That was the great cart that he brought back. And you saw that cart previously because the other gentleman walked you up to it, right? That is correct. Um, so when this gentleman brings you the cart, does it appear to have been... Uh, objection, leading. Sorry. Sustained. Did it seem different when the gentleman brought it back to you? Leading. Sustained. Um, how did the cart look when it was brought to you? Uh, the cart looked the same to me. Um, it was in disorder. 
There was still two guns on top of it. What did we just see you do there? I cleared the gun and I secured it in the front of my unit. And what does it mean to clear a gun? Uh, I was making it safe for myself and for the crime scene tech, who or a detective that would look look for it, uh, look at it after I secured it. Did it have any ammunition in it? It did not. What did you do with that gun? I secured it in the front of my unit and I locked the door. you spoke of? That is the cart that I originally uh, was uh, taken to by the other gentleman. Same cart. saw you take something uh, what did you take there were two white boxes um, of rounds that uh, uh, the prop person Hannah said that these were the uh, rounds used and this person uh, that you are that, that you took those rounds from the person that's right here in the center of the, of the video screen is that Ms. Gutierrez yes it is Do you see Ms. Gutierrez sitting in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Can you just go ahead and point her out and tell us what she's wearing for the record? Uh, she's wearing a gray jacket and a white top. And also, just for the record, where is Bonanza Creek Ranch located? Um, Bonanza Creek Ranch is on the um, southern end of Santa Fe County. Um, it's off the frontage road. I-25 Frontage Road. For the record, state of New Mexico. In the state of New Mexico. Thank you, sir. Yes. Just relax, okay? <laughs> I just need you to relax. Just please relax, okay? Just take deep breaths and relax. Can somebody get water for her? Mr. Benavides, do you know why the helicopter is still there? Um, the helicopter, in my experience, lands and they try to, to um, stabilize the victim before they fly him out. The victim has to be stable before they fly him out. Can that sometimes take time? Yes. From my experience, yes, it takes a little bit of time. Remember your names, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Can somebody get him water? remember where those boxes of ammunition are right now yes they're on the on the left side of the cart on a piece of paper and are, are are you keeping an eye on them I am and you saw what they did you see them when she handed them to you um, I saw them I know what they physically look like yes thank you my Okay, so, um, yes, I mean, I'm not worried about the insurance, I'm worried about her life, so. Oh, absolutely, okay, that's so, what I'm saying. So, uh, no, no. What can I do to help you? Um, we are bringing a whole lot of units here because there's a whole lot of people here. Yes, we're trying okay. to clear them out. No, nope, nobody's getting cleared out. Everybody is staying where they're at. Okay. Okay, we're trying, that's what so difficult we're trying to hold everybody where they're at okay okay what i'm going to have you do is sit in here okay arrested. you're not arrested <laughs> the door's going to stay open uh since you're the armor they're going to want to talk to you more than anybody okay <laughs> mr benavides uh why did you ask ms gutierrez to get into your truck um with the scene being so active um and her being the armor, I couldn't have her walk off and lose her. Um, so I, should, I I put her in my unit. As I, as you heard, I, I, she was not under arrest. They just needed to talk to her. Um, can you describe the inside of your unit? Yes, it, it's caged from the middle of my unit. My windows are, are caged up also. And you cannot get into the front of my unit at all. Not even if you're sitting in the back? Not even if you're sitting in the back. You, you, don't, you do not have access to the front of my vehicle. Can I please have that water? Yes. Oh my God. Just relax, okay? I'm just trying to, if there's a whole lot of people here, so I'm trying to secure everybody. Do you want me to tell you? You can stay right here with us. You can leave the door open. You, you don't have to do anything, okay? Hey! To the bed! saying there I believe um, I was telling Corporal Dereta to put the uh, yellow tape to the med truck I think it, or or I was what? asking or I was asking for a, a med unit to come and check on Hannah understood and why would you ask for for a medical unit to come check on Hannah uh, the way she was um, she was pretty much hyperventilating and, and I didn't want her to pass out, and then we have a bigger problem. Okay. Is that a bit? If I could have a unit head to St. B's, we got one shot in the shoulder. Uh, that one's going to St. B's. The helo just uh, landed, and they are trying to get that uh, other 41 stable. So if I could have a Somebody go to St. Uh, B's and uh, his uh, other subject. What is St. B's for people who don't know that short name? Um, that's uh, St. Vincent's Hospital here in Santa Fe. And why are you sending a unit to St. B's? Um, for one, for logistics to help the detectives find out how the victims are doing. Let me also ask you this. Is there potentially evidence to be collected? Uh, yes, there is. Clothing, stuff like that. Yes. Anything else you can think of? Maybe the projectile still in them. I don't, you know, I don't know. 
Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Do you need a radio truck down? No, not at all. I'm sorry. I didn't even step up. Thank you. what that conversation was about so deputy lafleur and i were conversating on what we have um he was telling me who the shooter was um and who he had over there he had more witnesses um and what we were talking about because there's four of us now uh there was another deputy that just showed up on scene we were trying to um keep everybody separated um so they wouldn't talk about the case and is there a specific person that you're talking about keeping separated? Um, Alec Baldwin. Thank you. Production card. If, if you get all the direct, you get a production card. Is it? Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, I'm just trying to. Let me know how. Yeah. Mr. Benavides, do you remember who you're talking to? I believe I was talking to Lieutenant uh, Michael Martinez. Uh, he was the Lieutenant of the Criminal Investigation Division, the detectives. And I was briefing them over the phone what was happening. Why would you do that? Because um, this goes straight to him and his detectives. So I was trying to brief him of what equipment he might need, how many personnel he might need. Did you say the situation is very fluid? Yes. What did you mean? It is an active scene. There's still people walking around, um, still people trying to get into the church. Um, there are just people everywhere, everywhere.
Do you want to talk to me, sir? Alec is gonna he's gonna smoke a cigarette and he'll sit in his own car. Okay. His vehicle. Alec Baldwin? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I'm good, thank you. I just drank a Red Bull uh, right before there. I'm all hyped up. Sorry. Okay. I'm gonna stand by, so if you need to yes, please. Attack. I need somebody to check for her. Okay. okay. The, the armor? Yeah, she's the armor. She's hyperventilating. She's having a. So I was told that he was in the church, um, so I was directing him towards either Copa Alderete or uh, Deputy Lafleur. And for what purpose? Uh, he was uh, possibly a witness. The yeah, Alcestors. Uh, we were told by the priest. Okay, hold on. All right, let me see who you guys are. Okay. I don't want too many people here. Okay, hold on. What's up? I don't have any additional security guards. I got one. I got a key. Okay, I've got my two guys right here. You can post them wherever you want. Okay, well, thank you. I'll figure that out. Let me go see what's going on with these guys, and I'll be right back. Okay, just standing by. Yeah, thank you. Okay, who is this? 
This is our lawyer. Okay. Lieutenant Benavides, I didn't mean to be rude to you, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to sit here. I'm just trying to secure everybody. And who is that? Benavides. Benavides. So I have a whole lot of people coming this way, so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, these two gentlemen right here are Lucas and Marcos. They are my location peeps. Yes. Um, a little farther down in the white is Shannon. She's the owner of the ranch. Okay. The gentleman who I was talking to earlier in the brown hat is Brian, the production designer. Yes, I met him. Yeah. Okay. I'll be with, with you in a okay. little bit, ma'am. Okay. Let me talk to my guys to secure this area. I need somebody on that side to secure, so we're not going in and out. We're trying. We're everybody, pretty much, that's in is staying in. Uh, Who are these officers? What's happening here? Uh, more deputies coming, like I was asking for. Um, so this makes uh, six deputies on scene right now. Uh, we're. I'm just trying to direct them to try to secure uh, as much of the scene as I can. The crime scene log because it's still fluid. We still have that. He's still on, on deck. Okay, I don't know. Patient's still here. One patient's still here. Um, do we have somebody going to the hospital? Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. Where do you want to If you can stand on that side and make sure people aren't coming in and out, everybody that's in stays in. Did I hear you say uh, that one of the injured people was still there? Yes, that's correct. And do you know why? Uh, they were trying to get the female uh, stable so they could uh, fly her up. Still? Still. Here, I have the corporal on that side with Sanchez. He's still trying to get the information. It looks like we have all the people that were in the room. I have one. I have one in the room. Okay, come here. If you could go see that gentleman. Sanchez! Yeah. Um, I need you to stay by my unit. Okay. Um, it's, I have the weapon in my truck in my truck, okay. and all the ammunition on that tray. Okay. Okay. So it was an actual crime? Um, it was uh, Alec Baldwin. He's sitting over there. He shot, and then he shot. He got the gun from the armor who I have in my car. Um, she's not under arrest. She just moved out. What's an entry point? Um, it's a check-in point for whoever comes into the into the scene right now. Um, from now on, um, as detectives, crime scene techs, um, who, uh, medical personnel, whoever else is coming on board. So, is there a break in the crime scene tape right there? Um, I believe Deputy. I I don't remember if Deputy Puentes. Put a break, or he's just lifting up the tape. I don't. I don't remember which. Where is the tape at this point in time? It is the yellow tape is connected to my vehicle, and it's pretty much connected to all the sheriff's personnel vehicles that are on scene. And is it what? What is it cordoning off? Uh, it's cordoning off the makeshift church. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and I still have those, uh, charges to me. I just, I told him to... Yeah, perfect. But I didn't get anything, so that's where we're going. No. It's in here. It's in my unit. Why are you giving this information to this gentleman? Tell us what's happening. 
So the med unit is asking what kind of weapon was used. Um, and I'm letting them know what Hannah told me. Is it was a 45. She pointed to the to the two white ammo boxes, and they and I was reading out the ammo boxes, 45 dummy rounds. Bear with me. I'm trying to. There we go. What did those boxes look like? Um, two white ammo boxes. Um, they were white and it had a label on the on the flap end. Did you recognize them? Um, recognize as it how? Had you seen them previously? Oh yes, um, they're the ones that Hannah um, told me that these were the rounds used. Um, for that day. Did they look different? They did not. Did the prop cart look different? It did not. I believe the one on the left, the white shirted lady, is the lawyer. And where are the witnesses who were in the church at the time of the shooting? Um, they are in the front of the church with Corporal Darete or with Deputy Lafleur. How far away from those people is she? The lawyer? Yeah. Um, shouty distance, I guess. If she were to shout, would you have heard her? Yes. Verse for the yeah. med birth and social. For me or for her? For her. Uh, would anybody have that? Yeah, give me two seconds. Thank you. Nice. Uh, Helena Hutchins, H-Y-L-E-N-A. You got a duck? Yep. So I have, looks like Alec Baldwin is the one that holds the trigger. Yeah, but I have the armor in my unit. I have the gun with Puentes, and there the tray has the dummy rounds. Okay, um, uh, I have Frederick on that side. Uh, Puentes is taking care of here. He's gonna start taking care of the log. This down until they get the patient still behind there until the HP dog is in there. I'll put it up. Okay. And then make sure everybody goes to Sanchez. All the personnel that were in there. Yeah. Make sure he has everybody. Okay. It's gonna get Sanchez up there. There's a lot of people here. Yeah. I have more people coming. Here you say you have more people coming? Um, I was hoping I had more people coming, but I kept asking for more people. Let me, let me ask you, how big is the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department? Um, when I left, we had 100 officers. And it, if you can estimate for us, on a day like October 21st, 2021, uh, how many officers would have been available to respond to this call out? Um, three deputies. Um, all I had. That's all I had. Um, we are stationed all over the county. So I, I was a rover. Um, I believe the corporal was up was north of Santa Fe County. 
Um, and then I had a, a deputy that was assigned to um, Santa Fe. But in this case, Deputy LaFleur was coming in for overtime and he happened to hear the call and he helped out. Thank you. She okay? She okay? She's checking out. I know, that's, that's why I called the meds for her. Yeah, yeah. I want her checked to make sure she's not, you know. Yeah, I think they're testing sure. Oh, right now. Okay. Like, we just need her. Right. I'll bring it back. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, I have the two ammo boxes um, in my hand from the cart that Hannah pointed out that were used. We keep everything else the same. How many like these? Like these here? Uh huh. Those are done. Okay. Well, I, I'm pretty sure somebody will. will be happy. What did that guy just do? Uh, he reached over the yellow tape and he grabbed a bullet and he shook it um, to show that it was a dummy round. Um, and then he put it back. And, and where did he grab it from? One of the boxes? No, he did not. There was like a little cubby on the tray. He just reached over, grabbed it and put it back. And you saw that? Yes. what you just did there with the two white ammo boxes that Hannah pointed out that were used that day uh, I secured them in the front of my unit on the driver's side seat and was the unit locked um, as soon as I closed the door I hit my manual switch and I heard it and it clicked closed did you see anything that would cause you to believe that anyone planted evidence? Uh, I did not, no. Did you see anything that would cause you to believe that anyone tampered with anything on that cart? No. Any reason to believe anyone got into your unit and did anything with the evidence you had in there? No. take our afternoon break. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you. All rise. All right, thank you. Uh, we're in recess. We'll uh, begin again at, uh, be here in 20 of, jury will be back probably at quarter of. Um.
That's good. You may be seated.
You may be seated. Test, test. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Can we back up? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are on the record. Uh, Mr. Benavides, let's uh, let's go ahead and just watch the last few minutes of this video for completeness, okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So right now, I do have the dummy rounds, the armor, and the gun secured. Okay. Yes. That's when I grabbed her right away. She was a, and we did secure the film. We do have the film secured, which they'll have to go over with the product and all that, but that's, that's going to be later down the line, I think, or, or whenever. But everything was getting filmed. Okay. Um, the helo's still on the ground. Right now, I don't know. Uh, they're still working there. Did you see the helicopter there? Yes, I did. Any idea why that helicopter is still there? Uh, like I said before, they're still trying to stabilize her so they could fly her up. Thank you, sir. Can you ladies doing okay? No, just yeah. wait on your green light. Yes. I'm to be getting wherever it is that uh, people are being interviewed. Okay, that's not going to be on us. The detectives are coming. Okay, so it's not begun yet. What's that? The, the interviews have not yet begun. No, I have not. Nothing. We just secured the armor. Okay. We secured the gun okay. and the ammunition. Okay. That's, it. that's the only thing we've done. That's the only thing that's happening right now. Yes, okay. and then we are getting all the information, all the people that were in the room. Okay. okay, I'm going to go check on, on the victim. Yeah. I don't know you went to no, she's still here. They're, still, still here. They're, they're trying to stabilize her. Okay. I will let you know how she's doing. Thanks. I know you guys are concerned, yes. so I'm going to let you guys know, okay? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. did you get right there uh, the female Helena Hutchins was stable but in critical condition they're stabilizing her so they could fly her up thank you sir yes right through through the chest what's up chief sir they're taking so long. they're trying to stabilize her then we have the medic in there from the med and they're trying to stabilize her it looks like I just asked they said they're trying to stabilize her she's critical so yeah you know that no, I know, just sometimes the... Sorry about your blues, I know you're at the... Oh, the ceremony? Yeah. yeah. Well, Where are 
Jordan. She's here. Panic, one of the guys went to the back. This Russell guy, the one of the I need everybody right here separated. I thought that's what the corporal told you. Get everybody here separated. Okay. Nobody leaves. discussion regarding a witness who left? Yes, it was. Do you know if that was a person who was inside the church or just a person who was working on set? I don't, I don't remember, um, but uh, like I said, it was, the scene was active and we're trying to keep people <coughs> together, but um, this one person did get out. Thank you. Need it open? No, I just It's open? Yeah, and you can get a clipboard. to the helo that's a good sign the stabilizer yes. and they're gonna fly her out yes okay anything else i'm gonna find you guys okay okay um you'll see the detectives they're all on unmarked cars yep. they're gonna come in a crime scene back okay and they'll when you they get here i'll give you the lieutenant and Perfect. okay thank you and i'll hand them over to you, thank you. okay I yes ma'am gentleman was asking if they could move Hannah from the back of my unit to a vehicle. She was not under arrest, um, I guess to make her more comfortable. And what was your response to him? I said, sure, as long as we could see the vehicle, I was going to post a deputy with her. into your video this video anyway yes ma'am all right thank you
Oh yeah, right. Oh okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh Mr. Benavides, I'm gonna show you what uh, has been marked as state's exhibit sixty one and I believe there's no objection to its admission. We'll do 61 and 62, uh, no objection to the admission to 61 and 62. State 61 and 62 are admitted, you may publish. Thank you. Sir, I'm showing you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 61. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Have you seen this photo before? Yes. What is this a photo of? That is the driver's side of the inside of my unit and it has two white boxes. What are those boxes? Those are the boxes that I secured from the gray cart into my driver's seat. Did you take this picture? I did not. Who would have taken this photo? Uh, our crime scene tech. So would you have left the boxes there in your car until the crime scene tech arrived to take a picture? That is correct. Anything change about these boxes? No. I just zoomed in. Can, can can you tell us what you see there on the on the the label? Yes, it says forty five long colt dummies. Do you see something there in the in the middle? Um. It looks like it's initials. Okay, and it's okay if, if you can't make them out, but you see what I'm, you see what I'm... Uh, yes, right under the end. Right there? Okay. Yes. That was State's Exhibit 61. Oh, it was, it, it was zoomed in, sorry. Um, this is State's Exhibit 62, uh, what we just looked at. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. Sorry, I just unplugged it. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Would you agree with me that the identification, preservation of evidence is important in a crime scene? Yes, it is. Uh, sorry, uh, Judge, if I could have George's help. Just need to hook into the HDMI. Why is that important? Oh, where's your part? It's important because the scene is important also and the preservation of, of evidence is, is needed. That's not HDMI. Okay. And why are those things, how did you do those things in this case? Um, the best I can, the best I could, due to the uh, evolving um, scene that was happening. Okay. And I'm going to go back to your uh, lapel video here. You had testified, sir, that you had three deputies to work with? In the beginning, Deputy Lafleur, myself, and Corporal Derete. All right, and the additional deputies did arrive, right? They did. All right, do you remember when they got there? Uh, it seemed like a long time. I would say within 30 minutes. All right. Is, uh, how long have you worked with the Sheriff's Department before you retired? 20 years. All right. Uh, in the cases that your former 
agency investigates, do they keep dispatch logs? Uh, yes, they do. What is a dispatch log? Uh, just something that comes over the radio and our dispatcher writes it, uh, types it out right. that they feel that's important. All right, and the time that an officer is dispatched to a scene is always noted in that log, right? I believe so. And their arrival time is also noted, right? Yes. All right. Um, do you have any objection to the dispatch log being admitted? <clears throat> All right, uh, Judge will offer the dispatch log as defendants, specifically the first two pages of it, as uh, exhibit defendants exhibit A. Uh, sir, what are we looking at here? Just a minute. Any objection to defendants A? No, Your Honor. All right, you may um, submit it and you may publish. What are we looking at here, sir? It looks like a crime uh, dispatch log, sorry. Okay. And I've highlighted this entry here. It says Unit 32. It's got an employee ID. Description arrived at, that's 14.02. Would that be 2 p.m.? That'd be 2 p.m., yes. All right. Is that... Deputy LaFleur? I believe so, he, if he was Unit 32. Um, I believe he was Unit 32. Okay. And I know it's been a while and you've retired, but do you remember what your unit was? Uh, unit 8. Unit 8. All right. So you arrived at 220? Yes. All right. Now there are, on this dispatch log, one, two three, four, five uh, other units noted as arriving right around the same time as you. Are you sure you only had three deputies to work with at that time? All we had was three deputies. I don't know where six, three, um, six, five. That was 14, 18. That was 18 minutes later. Then I, well, I don't. I couldn't tell you about the misprints, but I know when I got there. Okay. I I couldn't tell you. There was only three deputies, and you could see by my body worn camera that I only had three deputies. Okay. I don't want to take more of your time, you know, being retired and all, and yeah, the jury's see. time. We watched your whole video. You did see additional deputies come onto your lapel, right? Yes, I did. All right. After those deputies arrived, uh, why couldn't you have separated those witnesses with the extra manpower that you had? So I was still processing the whole scene at the time, and I was trying to direct them where I think they needed. Um, okay. Would you agree with me that it's important to separate witnesses? Yes, it is. Why is that important? Because you get witnesses um, telling stories, what they saw and not, and then they, they start getting mixed up when the witnesses start talking. So it can affect the integrity of their observations. That is correct. Okay. And Uh, 
George, I, could, I just need to stop publishing for a minute. Uh, Council, I've got a couple uh, exhibits I'd like to introduce. If you wouldn't mind coming up, I can show them to you. Uh, Judge, I'll move to admit photographs as defendants exhibits uh, B, C, D, E, and F. Defendants B through F are admitted. You may publish. All right. So what's, uh, as part of securing the scene, you use crime scene tape, right? Yellow crime scene tape, that's issued to us, yes. All right, and that's this tape here? Yes. All right. Why do you guys use crime scene tape? Um, we use crime scene tape to, to secure a perimeter. Why is that important? The integrity of the scene. All right, if the perimeter is not secure, why, why is that a problem? Uh, people could go in and out. Um, they could take evidence, bring evidence. Okay. Uh, who figured out where to put this crime scene tape? I believe it was Copa Aldarete and Deputy Lafleur. Um, Did you give them instruction on how to do that? Um, I don't believe I did. I think we were just trying to secure as much as we could at the time, um, trying to have people go in and out of the scene. Okay, and how did you determine, I guess, what the scene was? Well, we knew the scene was inside the church where the, uh, where the Joel and Helena were. Okay, and one of the things you wanna do when you're establishing a crime scene uh, when you put up the tape, the, the perimeter, you want to make sure that all the important evidence is within that perimeter, right? Uh, yes, we try to, yes. Okay. Uh, do you see that black tent in the background? Yes, I do. All right. Do you remember walking up to that black tent on your lapel video? Um, if I do, I don't remember, but...
for you. Should you, yes. have done, should you have done that yourself? Of course I should have done that myself. But I kept an eye on him while he was, secure, while he was getting it, while everything else was going on. Uh, you'd agree with me that prop truck, the, uh, excuse me, the prop cart was by that black tent. Yes. In this photograph, right? Yes. About how far away was that from um, where you're standing right here? A good 50 yards. All right. Could you, if someone were to pick something up off the cart or place something onto the cart from that distance, do you think you could actually see if they something like that happened? Yes, I think I could have. Okay. I notice you're wearing glasses. Uh, how's your vision? Pretty good. Pretty good. All right. And you would agree with me that you would actually need to be looking at the cart to make sure nothing like that's happening, right? Correct. And why would you need to do that? Just to make sure that he brings the cart to me. Because if you're not looking at the cart, it's like the penny. Yes. Something could be, you know, you don't know it's the same thing. Yes. Because you just did not personally observe it. Correct. All right. Uh, Judge, now I'll go to uh, G. All right, so this is uh, uh, an excerpt from your lapel video, about 90 seconds. And uh, at the start of this video, you're talking with uh, this gentleman here and my client about the gun. I'm just going to play this for you. And then I'm going to ask you some questions, okay? Good. seconds. Uh, from the vantage point that you were looking at, could you have seen this cart? Yes. Do you see it on the video? Well, the video is pointed because the video is on my chest. So the video is pointed straight, but my head's looking at the cart. Okay. <clears throat> We need more units out here. Huh? Alright, so now your torso will be pointing if the cart's over there. It's maybe pointed east. In that direction, about 180 degrees from the cart? Yes. Did you have visual contact of the cart at this point in time? Yes. Did. I was looking at Hannah and I was looking at the cart at the same time because she was moving around so I was looking at her and I was looking at the cart. like you turned around there yes were you looking at the cart before you turned around yes I was looking back and forth back and forth my video is pointing straight because it's on my chest okay. so this gentleman here he essentially is the collector of this evidence, right? Yes, he offers his services to go get the cart, yes. All right. So he's the first link in the chain. Yes. And then you become the second link. 
Yes. And uh, Judge, I'll publish uh, little mark as Exhibit H. Yes, um, so she told me which guns were, I mean, which ones came from. Can you prove it? All right. Uh, that gentleman is now standing behind your crime scene tape. Yes. All right. Uh, is that gentleman allowed within the crime scene tape? No, not anymore. What, what do you mean, not anymore? Uh, we secured the crime scene tape, um, so they're supposed to stay out. Okay. And are they supposed to reach over it or breach it in any way? They are not. And why aren't they supposed to do that? Because we're the collector of evidence and it could be tainted. Okay. Everything else the same? I'm going to keep these like these here. All right, what's he doing there? Yeah, he's reaching over the yellow tape and grabbing around to give us an example of what a dummy round looks like. All right, why did you not tell him, hey, don't do that? I don't know. Do you agree with me that that was a, an investigative mistake on your part? Yes, that was a mistake by me, yes. Who is the deputy standing uh, to the right of that gentleman? That is Deputy Puentes. All right, and uh, he's one of the deputies that arrived the scene after you did? Yes. All right. Did you ask him to start a crime scene log? I asked him, yes. All right, what's a crime scene log? A crime scene log is people coming into the crime scene and we document who's there. Is that something that's important to do? Yes. Why is that important to do? So we know who was in the scene. All right, why is that important? Uh, so we could go back and uh, the detectives could <coughs> interview them and uh, see what their involvement was on the scene. And anyone who goes in or out is supposed to be in the log, right? Correct. Is that guy in the log? I don't know. I haven't seen the log. Okay. Uh, when did you ask Deputy Fuentes to start the crime scene log? I believe I asked him when he first showed up, if I remember correctly. All right. Do you know what time he actually started the thing? I do not know. If you were to look at his uh, report, could that refresh your recollection as to when he actually started the log? It sure would. Uh, Judge, if I could approach the witness. Show, show up. Ms. Morrissey. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. Is that your former colleague's police report? Yes. All right. Having looked at it, has it refreshed your recollection as to when the log was started? He advised on his report it was started at 2.38 p.m. Yes, approximately, yes. Okay. Should that log have been started earlier? Um, it should have, 
but the scene being so active and three deputies on scene, it was uh, difficult to start dialogue. this for you again. Um, I'm going to keep everything else the same. I'm going like to keep these, like these here. Uh -huh. Those are down here. Okay. Well, I, I'm pretty sure somebody will... Should Deputy Puentes have said something to this guy about yes. reaching over the tape? Yes, as well right. as I. And he, he didn't do that, right? Correct. All right. We saw later in your video uh, this gentleman also standing next to <coughs> Deputy Puentes, and he was actually within the tape. Do you remember that? I believe I do, yes. Okay. Um, why, why was he allowed inside the crime scene tape? That'd probably be a question for Deputy Puentes. I, should I have asked? Yes, I should right. have asked him why he was in the, within the yellow tape. You were in charge of this scene until investigations took it over, right? That is correct, yes. All right. So, th this guy was here for some time, uh, monitored by this deputy. As the scene supervisor, are you concerned that if this gentleman reached over once over the tape and interacted with the cart, maybe he did it again? Um, in front of Deputy Puentes, I don't know. Okay. Let's talk a bit about the gun. Uh, you said when you got the gun, you made it safe. What does that mean? Um, I looked in the cylinders to make sure there was no um, ammunition inside the cylinder. All right, and the shooting had just occurred, right? Yes. So the, the ammunition that was within the gun would be? It should have been still in there because it's a revolver. Yes, and it would be Highly relevant evidence in this case, right? Correct. All right. Now, on the video we listened to, uh, you can hear my client Hannah talking to Mr. Dave Halls, the first assistant director, and they're talking about uh, you know where that ammo is, right? I don't know what ammo they're talking about. Is it? What's your understanding as to where the ammunition inside of the forty-five caliber gun you collected went? I never asked that question. I do not know. You have no idea where that ammunition is? The one that was in the cylinder? No. What about the other five? Uh, I do not know. And what I, I know you said initially you only had three three deputies, but uh, I've seen a lot of that would look like vehicles on your lapel video. Uh, why couldn't you have sent these witnesses to go just wait in their cars and told them not to talk to anyone? Well, the the scene being so big, we tried to keep everybody corralled in one place where we could keep an eye on everybody. Um, to send people back to their vehicles. I don't know where their vehicles were. I don't, because uh, on a movie set there's staging areas and I don't know if that staging area was somewhere else. I do not know. Uh, 
Uh, just a minute, I've got just a couple more questions and I'll be okay. wrapped up. All right, Lieutenant, I want to show you just a couple uh, specific timestamps from your video. Uh, what are those over there? Uh, uh, can you see on the screen the two vehicles behind your vehicle? Yes, I see two vehicles there. All right, could witnesses have been placed there? One vehicle, one, I, I don't know. Um, Objection. It calls for speculation. Can you rephrase your question, please? Is there some reason uh, you do not have witnesses just staying in those cars? Like I said, the fluid was big. I mean, the scene was big. We were trying to corral everybody into one into one place where we could watch them and tell them not to talk. I mean, you are you telling me you couldn't watch those people if they're in those vehicles? I had I had Hannah in the back of my unit. Okay. Um, we All right. Are there several vehicles uh, looking straight ahead here? Yes, sir. Is is there a reason you didn't ask to house the witnesses um, in those vehicles? That's farther away from what we wanted, and we won't be able to control the, the scene. Judge, if I could just have uh, a moment before passing the witness. Sure. I don't have anything further. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Redirect. Just one moment.
Mr. <laughs> so what's going on? You try it. <laughs> okay. Let me just try to do this a little less so it's less painful. Can you have a look at your monitor there, Mr. Benavides? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Let's just be clear. Do you have any reason to believe that that gentleman in the hat tampered with any kind of evidence? No, I do not. Any reason to believe that he planted any evidence? No, I do not. When he reached over the crime scene tape and touched that dummy round on the cart. Were you there? I was looking straight at him. Yes. Did he plant any evidence? No. He picked it up, shook it, and he put it back down. Would you have noticed? Yes. If he planted evidence, you would have noticed? Yes, I would have noticed. Yes. I want to go through this slowly with you. Can you see, even on your video, what he is reaching into? Yes, it's a little um, cubby hole, and there's quite a few rounds in there. When he shook it, did it rattle? I do not remember. Now, these cars, that Mr. Bullion asked you about why you don't have witnesses in these cars. Do you own those cars? I do not own those cars, no. Do you know who owns those cars? I do not. As a police officer, are you allowed just to take a witness and put them in some vehicle that, that, that you don't know who owns the car? No, I'm not. Have you ever done that in your entire career? No. Sir, just to be clear, you indicated to Mr. Bullion that your video is facing one way, but that doesn't necessarily show us what you're looking at. Is that right? That is correct. Do you have a full range of motion in your neck? Yes, I do. You, have, you don't have any injuries that would prevent you from doing that? No, ma'am.
Can you think of a reason that it took a while to get the crime log started? Just how active the scene was, and, and it, was, it was, I was trying to get deputies assigned, um, um, you know, checking on everybody, checking on the, on the victim. Um, I, I do not know. For the first half hour that you were on scene, did you have enough personnel so that someone could start doing paperwork? No. Is a crime scene log paperwork? Yes, it is. The gun that you put in your unit, who handed it to you? Hannah. How many rounds of ammunition were in the cylinder when she handed it to you? None. Thank you, sir. Council approach. Thank you, sir. You're excused. Smith. Uh, Your Honor, just to be safe, I want to reserve Mr. Benavides, sure. so let's give him an instruction if he right. needs one. Please don't talk among the um, other witnesses about the case. Okay. Thank you. And anyone to be called as a witness in this case may not be bearing this trial live stream on Court TV. The state will call Marissa Popple. All right. Firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, have a seat. Talk into the microphone, please. please. Marissa Popple, P-O-P-P-E-L-L. -L. And how are you currently employed? I'm a crime scene technician with Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been a crime scene technician with the Sheriff's Office? Uh, with them for almost three years now. And were you a crime scene investigator anywhere else prior to coming to the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? Yes, I was with Fort Myers Police Department in Fort Myers, Florida for four years. So total time as a crime scene investigator, what do you got? Almost seven years now. How did you become involved in this case? I was notified by my lieutenant in the criminal investigations division that a shooting had occurred and we would be responding as the CID unit. CID means criminal, criminal investigation. investigation division. Okay. Um, and so, if you recall, approximately what time would, would, would you have arrived on scene? Um, I believe it was later in the afternoon that day, um, probably around 2 or 3 p.m. And 
What's your job as a, as a crime scene investigator or a crime scene technician? What do you do? So I'm responsible for documenting uh, any crime scenes, and this can be a variety of scenes, whether they be burglaries, homicides, shootings. Um, I'm responsible for photographing any evidence, uh, collecting that evidence, and packaging it as well. And after you collect it and photograph it and package it, what do you do with it? Um, depending on the circumstances of the evidence, uh, I often am responsible for it getting sent off to the lab for further analysis if that's needed. Did you send any of the evidence in this case off to a lab for further analysis? Yes, several items were sent to the FBI to their crime scene lab. Do you recall what items were sent? Um, if I can refer to my report, I can tell you what item numbers I have that were sent. I think it's fine for you to refer to your report. That's fine. Uh, according to my report, uh, items 1, 2, 3, 25, 26, 27, 140, Hang, hang on, I'm going to stop you. Uh, because we don't speak crime scene technician, can you give us an idea of what those items were? So these items were suspected live ammunition, um, DNA swabs that were collected from individuals, um, fingerprints that were collected from individuals, um, and additional ammunition that needed uh, analyzed at that time. Did you consider having fingerprints or DNA analysis done on the live rounds? So I believe that um, fingerprint analysis was completed on the live rounds. Um, however, the lab does not do DNA on any kind of ammunition, and that's a standard across most uh, forensics labs. Do you know why DNA isn't collected from uh, basically what I'm going to describe as casings, brass casings. It's just a very small likelihood of getting enough uh, cells to have enough for a profile to be developed, which is why they won't do it. Okay, thank you. Um, so you couldn't actually have them take DNA off those uh, live rounds? Correct. They wouldn't do it? Yes. Okay. They told you no? Yes. <laughs> um, did you collect all of the evidence from the scene at Bonanza Creek Ranch? Yes, I did. And did you get to collect evidence from uh, other items or other locations on different dates? Yes. Uh, what other areas or places did you collect evidence? Um, I also assisted with the search warrant that was done on the prop truck at Bonanza Creek and a search warrant that was conducted at a PDQ warehouse in Albuquerque. And do you recall when you conducted a search on the prop truck? I believe that was the week after the incident, um, if I can refer to my report. Uh, the 27th of October. And do you recall the date that you participated in the execution of the search warrant at PDQ Props? On November 30th. And do you know who owns PDQ Props? A Seth Kinney. All right. Um, so let's start with some of the evidence that you gathered from the scene at Bonanza Creek. And I see that you brought a box with you. Can you... Um, go ahead and pull that box out and let's uh, see what you've got. And
you want to? Yes, Your Honor. Can okay, I go ahead. Approach? Yeah. Mm -hmm. can just start, uh, 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 I'm going to ask you, well, Mr. Bowles, do you have any objection to entering any of those items into evidence? I, no, I, <coughs> no, I don't. Okay, and publishing them? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so let's start with the first one, and I will go ahead and mark it as States Exhibit 74. I have on the Elmo States Exhibit 74. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what we're looking at? So this is an ammunition box with a label that states 35 long Colt dummies. 35? I'm sorry, 45. My apologies. <laughs> um, and did you collect this? Yes, I did. Where did you collect this item from? Uh, this box was located in Lieutenant Benavidez's vehicle. And was it in this condition when you collected it? Uh, it was not. Tell us what condition it was in when you collected it. Uh, it was fully intact um, with a foam insert and rounds inside of it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and uh, have a look at State's Exhibit 75. Looking at here, this is the. Go ahead. I'm sorry. This is the foam insert that was inside of that ammunition box. And when it was inside the box, when you collected it, what did it have in it? It had um, multiple uh, ammunition rounds in it. Okay. Let's have a look at State's Exhibit 76. Tell us what uh, State's Exhibit 76 is. This is a 4440 uh, dummy round. Do you know where it came from? This was inside the foam insert in the ammunition box. How do you know it's a dummy round? When you shake it, you hear ball bearings inside of the round. Okay. 
Can everybody hear that? Let's have a look at States Exhibit 77. What are we looking at here? This is a 45 dummy round that has been um, deconstructed by the FBI. And what's in the little plastic container? So that is the ball bearing that was inside of this round. Okay, so this is just an example of what that looks like when you take it apart. Yes. All right. Tell us, here, let me, let me get States Exhibit 78. What do we have here? This is a 45 dummy round, but instead of having a ball bearing inside of it, it has a hole drilled through the side of it to distinguish it as a dummy round. So when you shake this dummy round, does it rattle? No. And the dummy rounds that rattle, do they have holes in the side? No. So it either has a hole in the side or it rattles? Yes. Okay. States Exhibit 79. Tell us what we're looking at. This is a 45 live round that was located inside of that same ammo box. How do you know it's a live round? Inside the plastic cylinder is all of the gunpowder that the uh, FBI forensics lab took out when they deconstructed the round. Can you see that? Yes. I know it's hard because of the glare. There, that's a little bit better. Um, what is that silver thing on the top? Do you know what that's called? That would be the primer. And is it silver or nickel? Yes, it's silver. States Exhibit 80. States Exhibit 80. This was the other box of ammunition that was located in Lieutenant Benavidez's vehicle. Um, did you personally inspect what was in that box? Yes. And what is that box full of? Uh, each of these rounds is a blank round, meaning instead of a projectile on the head, they have kind of a crimped end to them. Okay, thank you. States Exhibit 81. States Exhibit 81, what are we looking at? This is a 4440 dummy round that was taken out of a box marked 3840. And what does 4440 mean if you know? Um, that would be the caliber of the round. So is a 4440 different than a 45? Yes. I'm going to show you uh, what we marked as States Exhibit 82. What's that? 
this is a 3840 taken out of that same box marked 3840. This is a 3840? Yes. That was in the box marked 3840? Yes. And what else was in the box? 4440s. And the where were the 3840 dummy rounds found? I believe they were in a bag in the prop truck. Okay. And inside the bag, were they just loose? They were in an ammo box in the bag. Did you find 3840 dummy rounds in any other location? I don't believe so. Okay. Does it rattle? Yes. States Exhibit 83. What are we looking at here? This is a 45 dummy round taken from a box of ammunition located in the prop truck. I'm going to show you what uh, we've previously looked at that is States Exhibit 78. And I don't know how well you can see because of the glare, um, but folks will be able to actually look at them. Uh, is there a difference between 78 and 83 visibly? Can you tell them apart? Um, there is, uh, can I see the bottoms of them as well? Yeah, and, and, and let me ask you, um, the, let me back up for a moment. The box that 83 came out of, how many other rounds were in that box, if you recall? Um, there were 17 rounds in total in that box. And what color primers did all of those have? silver. And was there any other distinguishing characteristics about those dummy rounds compared to the other ones? And I'm not talking about projectile. Uh, they all had a patine to them, so almost a discoloration, to, so they were made to look old. And when you say that, are you talking about the brass was actually a different color? Yes. Okay. Um, and those, the dummy rounds that you found, uh, that, that you collected, that had that patine to them, did they all have sil silver primers? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Yes. <clears throat> did you find any other dummy rounds on set other than the ones that have the patine to them that had silver primers dummy rounds I'm sorry you're asking if there were any other round any other dummy rounds that had a silver primer to them other than the ones that had the patine no so only the patine colored dummies had silver primers yes okay How 
about States Exhibit 84? States Exhibit 84, what is that? So this is another 45 a dummy, dummy round with a silver primer. And is it patine? Yes. I'm going to show you what is States Exhibit 83. It's a little hard to see through the plastic, but is there a difference between uh, 83 and 84. No, they are both patined. Is there a difference in the projectile? Uh, one projectile is slightly larger than the other right on the nose area. And when you're looking at those, uh, when they're not in the plastic, can you tell that pretty easily? Yes. And just for completeness, States Exhibit 85, what are we looking at there? This is another 45 dummy round taken from that same box that has been deconstructed by the FBI. And we can see that there were BBs inside of it? Yes. All right, so prior to it being deconstructed? It, it would rattle. rattle. It would rattle. Okay, thanks. Uh, do you have States Exhibit 86? I'm showing you what we've marked as States Exhibit 86. Can you tell us what that is? This is a 45 dummy round. On the side of it, it has a hole drilled into it, and there is no primer on it. Let's see if I can manipulate this so we can see what we're looking at. Is that the hole you're referring to? Yes. And you indicated that it does not have a primer? Correct. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, where we would normally see a primer, instead it has a hole. So how many different kinds of dummy rounds in terms of characteristics that would enable someone to distinguish them from a live round, how many different kinds did you find on set? Uh, there were a few on set, and there's the ones that rattle, there are ones with holes drilled into the side, and there are ones with holes drilled into the side that do not have a primer. Now, are you familiar with revolvers and the way that revolvers work? Yes. If a revolver is loaded with rounds, can you see the hole in the side? No. When you, when you look at the revolver? If you are looking at it from the angle of you've loaded the cylinder, no, you won't be able to see the side of the rounds. What can you see? You can see the primer area. So, 
if a gun was loaded with number 86, would you be able to tell that it had dummy rounds in it without taking them out of the cylinder? Yes. What would a bullet do if it didn't have a primer, even if it had gunpowder inside? There would be no reaction uh, because there'd be nothing for it, uh, the hammer to hit, the primer okay. to hit. It wouldn't fire, right? Correct. Okay. And States Exhibit 87. What's that? So this is a different type of dummy round that was located. Uh, it's a 45, but it's actually made as a replica round. Um, you can see where there was a hole drilled in the side and then it was filled in. And <coughs> can you see the hole that was filled in right there? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Does it rattle? No, it does not. And it doesn't have a hole in the side because it's been filled in, right? Correct. What does the primer look like? The primer is intact and is brass, but it does have a shine to it, almost like there was a resin polish put over it. Is that the primer right there? Yes, it is. So if it doesn't rattle and it doesn't have a hole in the side and it isn't missing a primer, how do you know it's a dummy round? So even when a live round is shaken, you can hear the powder inside of it move. So this, this round in particular makes absolutely no sound when you shake it. Okay. What else do you have there? Um, let's look at 88, States Exhibit 88. Ma'am, when you were participating in the execution of the search warrant on the prop truck, did you locate a lever action rifle? Yes, I did. Was law enforcement able to easily clear it, meaning make it safe? No. Why not? We were not able to unload it on scene uh, because the firearm appeared to be jammed somehow. Uh, so it was taken back to our office uh, for our firearms uh, certified individuals to, to handle. And do you know what kind of ammunition that lever action rifle is supposed to take? Yes, it's supposed to take 4440s. And the ammunition that was taken out of that Lieber action rifle, did you collect it? Yes. And do we have it here as 88 and 89? Yes. I'm going to show you what we've marked as States Exhibit 89. What are those? So these are the three 4440 rounds that were inside of the rifle. And are they dummy rounds? Yes. And do you see um, any distinguishing characteristics that you can see from the outside to let you know that it's a 4440 and not a 45? So the 4440s have almost an elongation to their casing area. So you can see where they slightly tighten up in one area and then continue upwards. So yes, right where you're pointing.
And did you say that you found a 45 in there or not yet? I don't remember. If I okay. Guess. What what is what is state's exhibit 88? It is a 45 dummy round that was located inside that same rifle. Do you notice anything um, different about this dummy round than the other ones? There is some uh, damage done to the projectile head of this round uh, where it was forcefully removed from the rifle. Does a 45 caliber dummy, does it fit in that lever action rifle? It does not fit in a 44 40 rifle. All right. What else do we have? Is that the last item? Yes, it is. All right. I'm not going to take it out of the bag, but for, for right now, what is uh, State's Exhibit 90? So this is a shoulder holster that was located inside of the building. Do you know which actor used this prop? Yes, this belonged to Alec Baldwin. You collected this from the scene? Yes. You took a whole lot of photos, right? Yes. We're going to switch over to pictures from Elmo. How Without objection, I would ask the court to admit states exhibits three through 73. No objection, Your Honor. States three through 73 are admitted. Thank you, sir. We're going to publish them as it is. We're going to just right, well, allow publication. Okay. I'm showing you uh, what has been admitted as States Exhibit 3. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? This is the prop truck that was located outside of the main building at the scene. You said prop truck. Oh, I apologize. Prop cart. Okay. Um, and is this the condition it was in when you took your, your photo? Yes. Did you inspect this cart and remove items from it? Yes, I did. Would you describe the level of organization 
uh, associated with this cart? There were multiple rounds of multiple caliber uh, all over the top portion of this cart and additional boxes of rounds on the bottom part of this cart. And were there also just other items? Yes, there were uh, plastic guns, uh, gun belts, earplugs, miscellaneous paperwork. Oops. Let's do it this way, it'll be easier. Is that just a, a, another uh, photograph of that same prop cart? Yes, just a, at a different angle. And what are we looking at there? Here we can see the uh, spent cartridge casing that was located on top of the cart, as well as uh, additional ammunition that was located there. Okay, and that spent casing that we're looking at, um, you collected it from the cart? Yes. And did you send it to the FBI? Yes. Thank you. States Exhibit 5. Uh, what is this? This is a close-up of the bottom portion of the cart. States Exhibit 6. A different angle of the top of the cart. I'm going to zoom in. Can you see that right there? Yes. What is that on the lower right hand corner? It is uh, an ammunition round. Not in any particular box? Not in any box, no. States Exhibit 7, what's that? This is again the top of the cart and one of the firearms that was located on top of the park cart. I believe this was the one with a blocked cylinder, so it was not a functional firearm. So this was not the gun that was used in this incident? No. And States Exhibit 8, is that just a close-up? Yes. And what is this? This is States Exhibit 9. What are we looking at? This is the firearm that was used in this incident uh, after it had been collected and put into uh, an evidence box. And this is the firearm that was sent to the FBI? Yes. States Exhibit 10, what's this? This was the rifle that we were required to bring back to the office to safely unload. This is the one that was jammed? Yes. States Exhibit 11. These were the rounds that were removed from the rifle. Again, there are three 4440s and one 45. Do you know why this uh, round here seems to have a shorter projectile than the others? The 4440s uh, all had more square tops, and it, I would assume... Your Honor, I'm going to object sure. to the speculation. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. I'll, I'll withdraw that. Yeah. Um, let's go to States Exhibit 12. Uh, this is a close-up of the 45 round that was removed from the rifle. Is that the damage that you were talking about? Yes. States Exhibit 13, what's this? This is a close-up of the bottom of that same round. Thank you. And States Exhibit 14. This is a close-up of the bottom of the 4440 rounds. And can you see here on the head stamp, does it say? It says 4440. Thank you. Uh, States Exhibit 15, what's this? This was all of the ammunition that was loose and not in boxes that was located on top of the cart. And the rounds on top, what are those? Those are all blank rounds and they can be distinguished by that crimped end instead of having a projectile. And these rounds over here on the left, if you recall, um, were those dummies or not? Um, if I can refer to my report. Sure. So I believe these two rounds uh, were uh, dummy 45 rounds that rattled when shaken. 
And what about these two rounds over here on the right hand side? These two rounds uh, were later, uh, I, I apologize. Um, these two rounds were sent to the FBI because they were suspected live rounds, which the FBI confirmed. So these two rounds here, this picture was taken before they were sent to the FBI. Correct. And these turned out to be live rounds. Yes. Meaning real bullets. Yes. And what's this one down here? This is a dummy 45 round with a hole drilled in the side. And these were just loose on the prop cart? Yes. And I'm going to skip through some of the close-ups. That was States Exhibit 16, 17, States Exhibit 18. Is this a, a close-up of something? This is a close-up of the two live rounds. And what is this a picture of? The bottoms of those same rounds with silver primer. States Exhibit 20. These are the other two dummy rounds that were located on the truck, on the IVAR cart. Do you see a difference? Well, ha have a look at the, at, at the projectile um, of these rounds. And then, I'm gonna, th this is 20, I'm gonna go back to 18. Do you see a difference? On the live rounds, they appear to have a larger nose, so a, a wider nose area. Did you measure those? Yes. And what, what's, the, what's the diameter of that nose, that flat surface? Six millimeters. What's the diameter of, of, the, uh, uh, of the, the projectile, the tip of the projectile on States Exhibit 20? Four millimeters. Just more close-ups, I'm just going through here. Um, States Exhibit 23, do you recall what that was? I, I do not. It was 24, that's okay. Um, and States Exhibit 25, what's this? This was the uh, spent round located on top of the cart. And, and what is States Exhibit 26? the bottom of that round where you can see the silver primer. Why was this empty casing sent to the FBI? Uh, to determine if it had been fired from the firearm that we had in custody. Okay. And we'll have other folks speak to that. Um, States Exhibit 27. Can you tell me what we're looking at here? This is a close-up of one of the gun belts. Where was this gun belt collected from? I believe this gun belt was on top of the cart. The prop cart? Yes. <clears throat> um, were any of these rounds sent to the FBI? Yes. Which one? The one with the silver primer. Did that turn out to be a live round? Yes. Do you recall what actor used that gun belt? I believe this belt was assigned to Jensen Eccles. And let's look at State's Exhibit 27A. What is this a photo of? Uh, this was ammunition that was located from the top of the cart. Is it the same ammunition that came from that belt? Yes. Okay. Um, and why do you have it separated out like this? So this ammunition was separated out based on its physical description. So we have ammunition at the top that's 45s with brass primers. We have one round by itself, which was 45 with a silver primer and one round by itself, which was 45 with a hole drilled through the side. So all of these turned out to be dummies except this one here on the left. Correct. States Exhibit 28, what's this? This was a fanny pack that was located on top of that same cart. 
States Exhibit 29, what is this a picture of? This is a close-up of the inside of that uh, bag. And what are those things we're looking at? I believe all of these rounds that we're looking at now were blank rounds that were found in the bag. Okay. And did this bag have more than one pocket? Yes. States Exhibit 30, what are we looking at here? This is another pocket uh, in this pack. Uh, containing blank rounds. And states exhibit 31. Another pocket in this same bag with blank rounds inside. And states exhibit 32. This is inside that bag with a dummy round 45 with a hole drilled through the side of it. And let me ask you, how many dummy rounds all together did you collect from that crime scene? I believe, as far as dummy rounds go, I believe I have 255. And does that include the prop cart? Yes. Of those 255, approximately how many were not located in a box and not located on a gun belt? I would say probably around 50. So those 50 rounds, were they just loose in different places? Yes. Where were some of the places that you found loose rounds? Um, they were found loose in the bottom of boxes, uh, loose inside of the prop truck, just on the floor. Um, pretty much any boxes that were located. If there were ammo boxes inside of it, there were loose rounds also underneath the ammo boxes. All right. Uh, States Exhibit 33. I think these are close up, so we can go through them quickly. Okay. 33 and 34, can you, can you see what that is? Yes, this is a close up of that uh, dummy round that has the hole drilled through the side. Okay. States Exhibit 35. This is the bottom of that dummy round where the primer has been removed. So this is a dummy round that was taken out of that fanny pack? Yes. States Exhibit 36. What is this a photo of? This is a close up of one of the uh, gun belts. Let's talk about this one for a moment. Um, what actor was using this um, holster as a prop? This holster was assigned to Alec Baldwin. And are we looking in this picture at all of the rounds that were located in that gun belt? Yes. I see that on the left we have two rounds with silver primers. I want to ask you about the first one. Uh, this first round that my uh, pointer is on, did that, was that a dummy round? Yes. Why is this a different color than the other rounds? This round had that patine wear look to it that we had previously seen. So the dummy rounds with the patine looked like this from the top. Yes. This round right here next to it, was that a dummy round? No. What did that turn out to be? That turned out to be a live round. And these three here, these three rounds to the right, um, what did those turn out to be? Uh, two of those were 4440 rounds and one of them was a uh, 45 dummy round with ball bearings inside. Were they all dummy rounds? All three of these, yes. Okay. Uh, the only live round that was found in Mr. Baldwin's uh, holster is this one right here? Yes. And you sent that to the FBI? Yes. States Exhibit 37, what is this? This is a different view of that same holster. Is this the live round right here? Yes. 
I want you to look at this projectile. Is this projectile different than this one to the right? Yes. And is it different than the one next to that one? Yes. And is it different than this one? Yes. How is it different than this one? The one that your pointer is on right now has a more uh, elongated nose to it, which makes it a smaller nose width. And what's the measurement of that nose width? Four millimeters. And this round over here on the far left, can you see a difference between this projectile and this projectile? Yes. And what's that? The projectile on the far left has almost a crimping around the base of it. I want to ask you about all of the suspected live rounds that you found on set and sent to the FBI. Did they all look like this one? Yes. Did they all have silver primers? Yes. Did they all have the same head stamp? Yes. What is that head stamp? It states 45 Colt and has a Starline Brass logo. And did they all have the same shape projectile? Yes. Did they all have the same color brass? Yes. Meaning they were not patine? Correct. Okay. States Exhibit 38, what are we looking at here? These are those same rounds from the holster removed from the holster. So we just get a better view of uh, the, the casing? Correct. All right. States Exhibit 39. This was a gun belt that was located inside of the prop truck. And what, what kind of rounds uh, were, were in this belt? If I can refer to my report. Sure. Uh, in this belt were 22 45 Colt rounds with ball bearings inside and one uh, Spain Denix replica round. And do we have the Spain Denix replica round here in evidence? Yes. And all of the rounds in this gun belt, did they all have the patine color? Yes. And were any of them found to be live? No. States Exhibit 40. These are those same rounds removed from the gun belt. Thank you. States Exhibit 41. This is a close-up of the silver primer on the rounds. What States Exhibit 42? This was a box of ammunition collected from the prop truck. Is this the condition it was in when you collected it? Yes. States Exhibit 43, what's this? This is a close-up of a different box located in the prop truck. And what's in all those white boxes? Uh, different types of ammunition. And what's this here? I believe it was a Red Bull. All right. What states Exhibit 44? This was a Mary Kay bag that was located in the prop truck. And what's in these white boxes? Uh, various types of ammunition. And we can see some brass things down here in this little pocket. Do you know what those were? I believe those were spent blanks. And we'll go through these quickly. States Exhibit 44A. This was a close-up of the ammunition in that bag. What do we see over here? Uh, where your arrow cursor is? Yeah. Uh, I believe this is a spent blank, or I'm sorry, uh, spent blank rounds. And were they just loose in the bag? Yes.
we're going to break for the day, okay? So follow George. Take your tablets. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Do not read any stories about the trial or any subject matter um, related to this case. And um, don't do any research. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right. Be seated. Uh, are we, we going to take those and lock them up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you um, um, yes. email George or text George and tell him to come back into the courtroom? Okay. All right. Eight uh, thirty. Hmm? Did you say? I just wanted to let her. Eight thirty in the morning. Eight thirty. And we're going to lock up the exhibit set of been entered into evidence. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, is there is that box empty? Yes. Can we use that box? Yes. Okay. Counsel, can you think of anything that you need to bring to the court's attention so that we don't take up jury time? Judge, I can't think of anything right now. All right. Well, don't think tonight either, then. Okay. <laughs> I probably won't. <laughs> All right. Thank you. We're in recess.